Chapter 1 The longboat of the Marjorie W. was floating down the broad Ugambi with ebb tide and current. Her crew were lazily enjoying this respite from the arduous labor of rowing upstream. Three miles below them lay the Marjorie W. herself, quite ready to sail so soon as they should have clambered aboard and swung the longboat to its davits. Presently the attention of every man was drawn from his dreaming or his gossiping to the northern bank of the river. There, screaming at them in a cracked falsetto and with skinny arms outstretched, stood a strange apparition of a man. What the hell? ejaculated one of the crew. A white man, muttered the mate, and then, man the oars, boys, and we'll just pull over and see what he wants. When they came close to the shore they saw an emaciated creature with scant white locks tangled and matted. The thin, bent body was naked but for a loincloth. Tears were rolling down the sunken pockmarked cheeks. The man jabbered at them in a strange tongue. Rushun, hazarded the mate. Savvy English, he called to the man. He did, and in that tongue, brokenly and haltingly, as though it had been many years since he had used it, he begged them to take him with them away from this awful country. Once on board the Marjorie W., the stranger told his rescuers a pitiful tale of privation, hardships, and torture, extending over a period of ten years. How he happened to have come to Africa he did not tell them, leaving them to assume he had forgotten the incidents of his life prior to the frightful ordeals that had wrecked him mentally and physically. He did not even tell them his true name, and so they knew him only as Michael Sabrove, nor was there any resemblance between this sorry wreck and the virile, though unprincipled, Alexis Paulvich of old. It had been ten years since the Russian had escaped the fate of his friend, the archfiend Rokov, and not once, but many times during those ten years had Paulvich cursed the fate that had given to Nicholas Rokov death and immunity from suffering while it had mitted to him the hideous terrors of an existence infinitely worse than the death that persistently refused to claim him. Paulvich had taken to the jungle when he had seen the beasts of Tarzan and their savage lord swarm the deck of the Kincaid, and in his terror lest Tarzan pursue and capture him he had stumbled on deep into the jungle, only to fall at last into the hands of one of the savage cannibal tribes that had felt the weight of Rokoff's evil temper and cruel brutality. Some strange whim of the chief of this tribe saved Paulvich from death only to plunge him into a life of misery and torture. For ten years he had been the butt of the village, beaten and stoned by the women and children, cut and slashed and disfigured by the warriors, a victim of often recurring fevers of the most malignant variety. Yet he did not die. Smallpox laid its hideous clutches upon him, leaving him unspeakably branded with its repulsive marks. Between it and the attentions of the tribe the countenance of Alexis Paulvich was so altered that his own mother could not have recognized in the pitiful mask he called his face a single familiar feature. A few scraggly, yellow-white locks had supplanted the thick, dark hair that had covered his head. His limbs were bent and twisted, he walked with a shuffling, unsteady gait, his body doubled forward. His teeth were gone, knocked out by his savage masters. Even his mentality was but a sorry mockery of what it once had been. They took him aboard the Marjorie W., and there they fed and nursed him. He gained a little in strength but his appearance never altered for the better a human derelict, battered and wrecked, they had found him, a human derelict, battered and wrecked, he would remain until death claimed him. Though still in his thirties, Alexis Paulvich could easily have passed for eighty. Inscrutable nature had demanded of the accomplice a greater penalty than his principal had paid. In the mind of Alexis Paulvich there lingered no thoughts of revenge only a dull hatred of the man whom he and Rokoff had tried to break, and failed. There was hatred, too, of the memory of Rokoff, for Rokoff had led him into the horrors he had undergone. There was hatred of the police of a score of cities from which he had had to flee. There was hatred of law, hatred of order, hatred of everything. Every moment of the man's waking life was filled with morbid thought of hatred, he had become mentally as he was physically in outward appearance, the personification of the blighting emotion of hate. He had little or nothing to do with the men who had rescued him. He was too weak to work and too morose for company, and so they quickly left him alone to his own devices. 
The Marjorie W had been chartered by a syndicate of wealthy manufacturers, equipped with a laboratory and a staff of scientists, and sent out to search for some natural product which the manufacturers who footed the bills had been importing from South America at an enormous cost. What the product was none on board the Marjorie W knew except the scientists, nor is it of any moment to us, other than that it led the ship to a certain island off the coast of Africa after Alexis Paulvich had been taken aboard. The ship lay at anchor off the coast for several weeks. The monotony of life aboard her became trying for the crew. They went off and ashore, and finally Paulvich asked to accompany them, he too was tiring of the blighting sameness of existence upon the ship. The island was heavily timbered. Dense jungle ran down almost to the beach. The scientists were far inland, prosecuting their search for the valuable commodity that native rumour upon the mainland had led them to believe might be found here in marketable quantity. The ship's company fished, hunted, and explored. Paulvich shuffled up and down the beach, or lay in the shade of the great trees that skirted it. One day, as the men were gathered at a little distance inspecting the body of a panther that had fallen to the gun of one of them who had been hunting inland, Paulvich lay sleeping beneath his tree. He was awakened by the touch of a hand upon his shoulder. With a start he sat up to see a huge, anthropoid ape squatting at his side, inspecting him intently. The Russian was thoroughly frightened. He glanced toward the sailors, they were a couple of hundred yards away. Again the ape plucked at his shoulder, jabbering plaintively. Paulvich saw no menace in the inquiring gaze, or in the attitude of the beast. He got slowly to his feet. The ape rose at his side. Half doubled, the man shuffled cautiously away toward the sailors. The ape moved with him, taking one of his arms. They had come almost to the little knot of men before they were seen, and by this time Paulvich had become assured that the beast meant no harm. The animal evidently was accustomed to the association of human beings. It occurred to the Russian that the ape represented a certain considerable money value, and before they reached the sailors he had decided he should be the one to profit by it. When the men looked up and saw the oddly paired couple shuffling toward them they were filled with amazement, and started on a run toward the two. The ape showed no sign of fear. Instead he grasped each sailor by the shoulder and peered long and earnestly into his face. Having inspected them all he returned to Paulvich's side, disappointment written strongly upon his countenance and in his carriage. The men were delighted with him. They gathered about, asking Paulvich many questions, and examining his companion. The Russian told them that the ape was his nothing further would he offer, but kept harping continually upon the same theme, the ape is mine. The ape is mine. Tiring of Paulvich, one of the men essayed a pleasantry. Circling about behind the ape he prodded the anthropoid in the back with a pin. Like a flash the beast wheeled upon its tormentor, and, in the briefest instant of turning, the placid, friendly animal was metamorphosed to a frenzied demon of rage. The broad grin that had sat upon the sailor's face as he perpetrated his little joke froze to an expression of terror. He attempted to dodge the long arms that reached for him, but, failing, drew a long knife that hung at his belt. With a single wrench the ape tore the weapon from the man's grasp and flung it to one side, then his yellow fangs were buried in the sailor's shoulder. With sticks and knives the man's companions fell upon the beast, while Paulvich danced around the cursing, snarling pack mumbling and screaming pleas and threats. He saw his visions of wealth rapidly dissipating before the weapons of the sailors. The ape, however, proved no easy victim to the superior numbers that seemed fated to overwhelm him. Rising from the sailor who had precipitated the battle he shook his giant shoulders, freeing himself from two of the men that were clinging to his back, and with mighty blows of his open palms felled one after another of his attackers, leaping hither and thither with the agility of a small monkey. The fight had been witnessed by the captain and mate who were just landing from the Marjorie W, and Paulvich saw these two now running forward with drawn revolvers while the two sailors who had brought them ashore trailed at their heels. The ape stood looking about him at the havoc he had wrought, but whether he was awaiting a renewal of the attack or was deliberating which of his foes he should exterminate first Paulvich could not guess. What he could guess, 
however, was that the moment the two officers came within firing distance of the beast they would put an end to him in short order unless something were done and done quickly to prevent. The ape had made no move to attack the Russian but even so the man was none too sure of what might happen were he to interfere with the savage beast, now thoroughly aroused to bestial rage, and with the smell of new spilled blood fresh in its nostrils. For an instant he hesitated and then again there rose before him the dreams of affluence which this great anthropoid would doubtless turn to realities once Paulvich had landed him safely in some great metropolis like London. The captain was shouting to him now to stand aside that he might have a shot at the animal, but instead Paulvich shuffled to the ape's side, and though the man's hair quivered at its roots he mastered his fear and laid hold of the ape's arm. Come, he commanded and tugged to pull the beast from among the sailors, many of whom were now sitting up in wide-eyed fright or crawling away from their conqueror upon hands and knees. Slowly the ape permitted itself to be led to one side, nor did it show the slightest indication of a desire to harm the Russian. The captain came to a halt a few paces from the odd pair. Get aside, Sabrove, he commanded. I'll put that brute where he won't chew up any more able seamen. It wasn't his fault, Captain, pleaded Paulvich. Please don't shoot him. The men started it, they attacked him first. You see, he's perfectly gentle, and his mine, his mine, his mine. I won't let you kill him, he concluded, as his half wrecked mentality pictured anew the pleasure that money would buy in London, money that he could not hope to possess without some such windfall as the ape represented. The captain lowered his weapon. The men started it, did they, he repeated. How about that, and he turned toward the sailors who had by this time picked themselves from the ground, none of them much the worse for his experience except the fellow who had been the cause of it, and who would doubtless nurse a sore shoulder for a week or so. Simpson done it, said one of the men. He stuck a pin into the monk from behind, and the monk got him, which served him blooming well right and he got the rest of us, too, for which I can't blame him since we all jumped him to once. The captain looked at Simpson, who sheepishly admitted the truth of the allegation, then he stepped over to the ape as though to discover for himself the sort of temper the beast possessed, but it was noticeable that he kept his revolver cocked and levelled as he did so. However, he spoke soothingly to the animal who squatted at the Russian side looking first at one and then another of the sailors. As the captain approached him the ape half rose and waddled forward to meet him. Upon his countenance was the same strange, searching expression that had marked his scrutiny of each of the sailors he had first encountered. He came quite close to the officer and laid a paw upon one of the man's shoulders, studying his face intently for a long moment, then came the expression of disappointment accompanied by what was almost a human sigh, as he turned away to peer in the same curious fashion into the faces of the mate and the two sailors who had arrived with the officers. In each instance he sighed and passed on, returning at length to Paulvich's side, where he squatted down once more, thereafter evincing little or no interest in any of the other men, and apparently forgetful of his recent battle with them. When the party returned aboard the Marjorie W., Paulvich was accompanied by the ape, who seemed anxious to follow him. The captain interposed no obstacles to the arrangement, and so the great anthropoid was tacitly admitted to membership in the ship's company. Once aboard he examined each new face minutely, evincing the same disappointment in each instance that had marked his scrutiny of the others. The officers and scientists aboard often discussed the beast, but they were unable to account satisfactorily for the strange ceremony with which he greeted each new face. Had he been discovered upon the mainland, or any other place than the almost unknown island that had been his home, they would have concluded that he had formerly been a pet of man but that theory was not tenable in the face of the isolation of his uninhabited island. He seemed continually to be searching for someone, and during the first days of the return voyage from the island he was often discovered nosing about in various parts of the ship, but after he had seen and examined each face of the ship's company, and explored every corner of the vessel he lapsed into utter indifference of all about him. Even the Russian elicited only casual interest when he brought him food. At other times the ape appeared merely to tolerate him. He never showed affection for him, 
or for anyone else upon the Marjorie W., nor did he at any time evince any indication of the savage temper that had marked his resentment of the attack of the sailors upon him at the time that he had come among them. Most of his time was spent in the eye of the ship scanning the horizon ahead, as though he were endowed with sufficient reason to know that the vessel was bound for some port where there would be other human beings to undergo his searching scrutiny. All in all, Arjux, as he had been dubbed, was considered the most remarkable and intelligent ape that anyone aboard the Marjorie W. ever had seen. Nor was his intelligence the only remarkable attribute he owned. His stature and physique were, for an ape, awe-inspiring. That he was old was quite evident, but if his age had impaired his physical or mental powers in the slightest it was not apparent. And so at length the Marjorie W. came to England, and there the officers and the scientists, filled with compassion for the pitiful wreck of a man they had rescued from the jungles, furnished Paulvich with funds and bid him and his Arjux Godspeed. Upon the dock and all through the journey to London the Russian had his hands full with Arjux. Each new face of the thousands that came within the Anthropoids' ken must be carefully scrutinized, much to the horror of many of his victims, but at last, failing, apparently, to discover whom he sought, the great ape relapsed into morbid indifference, only occasionally evincing interest in a passing face. In London, Paulvich went directly with his prize to a certain famous animal trainer. This man was much impressed with Arjux with the result that he agreed to train him for a lion's share of the profits of exhibiting him, and in the meantime to provide for the keep of both the ape and his owner. And so came Arjux to London, and there was forged another link in the chain of strange circumstances that were to affect the lives of many people. Chapter 2 Mr. Harold Moore was a bilious countenanced, studious young man. He took himself very seriously, and life, and his work, which latter was the tutoring of the young son of a British nobleman. He felt that his charge was not making the progress that his parents had a right to expect, and he was now conscientiously explaining this fact to the boy's mother. It's not that he isn't bright, he was saying, if that were true I should have hopes of succeeding, for then I might bring to bear all my energies in overcoming his obtuseness, but the trouble is that he is exceptionally intelligent and learns so quickly that I can find no fault in the matter of the preparation of his lessons. What concerns me, however, is the fact that he evidently takes no interest whatever in the subjects we are studying. He merely accomplishes each lesson as a task to be rid of as quickly as possible and I am sure that no lesson ever again enters his mind until the hours of study and recitation once more arrive. His sole interests seem to be feats of physical prowess and the reading of everything that he can get hold of relative to savage beasts and the lives and customs of uncivilized peoples, but particularly do stories of animals appeal to him. He will sit for hours together poring over the work of some African explorer, and upon two occasions I have found him setting up in bed at night reading Carl Hagenbeck's book on men and beasts. The boy's mother tapped her foot nervously upon the hearth rug. You discourage this, of course, she ventured. Mr. Moore shuffled embarrassedly. I uh, essayed to take the book from him, he replied, a slight flush mounting his sallow cheek, but oh uh, your son is quite muscular for one so young. He wouldn't let you take it, asked the mother. He would not, confessed the tutor. He was perfectly good-natured about it, but he insisted upon pretending that he was a gorilla and that I was a chimpanzee attempting to steal food from him. He leaped upon me with the most savage growls I ever heard, lifted me completely above his head, hurled me upon his bed, and after going through a pantomime indicative of choking me to death he stood upon my prostrate form and gave voice to a most fearsome shriek, which he explained was the victory cry of a bull ape. Then he carried me to the door shoved me out into the hall and locked me from his room. For several minutes neither spoke again. It was the boy's mother who finally broke the silence. It is very necessary, Mr. Moore, she said, that you do everything in your power to discourage this tendency in Jack, he, but she got no further. A loud whoop, from the direction of the window brought them both to their feet. The room was upon the second floor of the house 
and opposite the window to which their attention had been attracted was a large tree, a branch of which spread to within a few feet of the sill. Upon this branch now they both discovered the subject of their recent conversation, a tall, well-built boy, balancing with ease upon the bending limb and uttering loud shouts of glee as he noted the terrified expressions upon the faces of his audience. The mother and tutor both rushed toward the window but before they had crossed half the room the boy had leaped nimbly to the sill and entered the apartment with them. The wild man from Borneo has just come to town, he sang, dancing a species of war dance about his terrified mother and scandalized tutor, and ending up by throwing his arms about the former's neck and kissing her upon either cheek. Oh, mother, he cried, there's a wonderful, educated ape being shown at one of the music halls. Willie Grimsby saw it last night. He says it can do everything but talk. It rides a bicycle, eats with knife and fork, counts up to ten, and ever so many other wonderful things, and can I go and see it too? Oh, please, mother, please let me. Patting the boy's cheek affectionately, the mother shook her head negatively. No, Jack, she said, you know I do not approve of such exhibitions. I don't see why not, mother, replied the boy. All the other fellows go and they go to the zoo, too, and you'll never let me do even that. Anybody'd think I was a girl or a mollycoddle. Oh, father, he exclaimed, as the door opened to admit a tall grey-eyed man. Oh, father, can't I go? Go where, my son, asked the newcomer. He wants to go to a music hall to see a trained ape said the mother, looking warningly at her husband. Who, Arjux, questioned the man. The boy nodded. Well, I don't know that I blame you, my son, said the father, I wouldn't mind seeing him myself. They say he is very wonderful, and that for an anthropoid he is unusually large. Let's all go, Jane, what do you say? And he turned toward his wife but that lady only shook her head in a most positive manner, and turning to Mr. Moore asked him if it was not time that he and Jack were in the study for the morning recitations. When the two had left she turned toward her husband. John, she said, something must be done to discourage Jack's tendency toward anything that may excite the cravings for the savage life which I fear he has inherited from you. You know from your own experience how strong is the call of the wild at times. You know that often it has necessitated a stern struggle on your part to resist the almost insane desire which occasionally overwhelms you to plunge once again into the jungle life that claimed you for so many years, and at the same time you know, better than any other, how frightful a fate it would be for Jack, were the trail to the savage jungle made either alluring or easy to him. I doubt if there is any danger of his inheriting a taste for jungle life from me, replied the man for I cannot conceive that such a thing may be transmitted from father to son. And sometimes, Jane, I think that in your solicitude for his future you go a bit too far in your restrictive measures. His love for animals, his desire, for example, to see this trained ape is only natural in a healthy, normal boy of his age. Just because he wants to see Arjux is no indication that he would wish to marry an ape, and even should he, far be it from you Jane to have the right to cry shame and John Clayton, Lord Greystoke, put an arm about his wife, laughing good-naturedly down into her upturned face before he bent his head and kissed her. Then, more seriously, he continued, you have never told Jack anything concerning my early life, nor have you permitted me to, and in this I think that you have made a mistake. Had I been able to tell him of the experiences of Tarzan of the Apes I could doubtless have taken much of the glamour and romance from jungle life that naturally surrounds it in the minds of those who have had no experience of it. He might then have profited by my experience, but now, should the jungle lust ever claim him, he will have nothing to guide him but his own impulses, and I know how powerful these may be in the wrong direction at times. But Lady Greystoke only shook her head as she had a hundred other times when the subject had claimed her attention in the past. No, John, she insisted, I shall never give my consent to the implanting in Jack's mind of any suggestion of the savage life which we both wish to preserve him from. It was evening before the subject was again referred to and then it was raised by Jack himself. He had been sitting, 
curled in a large chair, reading, when he suddenly looked up and addressed his father. Why, he asked, coming directly to the point, can't I go and see Arjux? Your mother does not approve, replied his father. Do you? That is not the question, evaded Lord Greystoke. It is enough that your mother objects. I am going to see him, announced the boy, after a few moments of thoughtful silence. I am not different from Willie Grimsby, or any other of the fellows who have been to see him. It did not harm them and it will not harm me. I could go without telling you, but I would not do that. So I tell you now, beforehand, that I am going to see Arjux. There was nothing disrespectful or defiant in the boy's tone or manner. His was merely a dispassionate statement of facts. His father could scarce repress either a smile or a show of the admiration he felt for the manly course his son had pursued. I admire your candor, Jack, he said. Permit me to be candid, as well. If you go to see Arjux without permission, I shall punish you. I have never inflicted corporal punishment upon you, but I warn you that should you disobey your mother's wishes in this instance, I shall. Yes, sir, replied the boy, and then, I shall tell you, sir, when I have been to see Arjux. Mr. Moore's room was next to that of his youthful charge, and it was the tutor's custom to have a look into the boys each evening as the former was about to retire. This evening he was particularly careful not to neglect his duty, for he had just come from a conference with the boy's father and mother in which it had been impressed upon him that he must exercise the greatest care to prevent Jack visiting the music hall where Arjux was being shown. So, when he opened the boy's door at about half after nine, he was greatly excited, though not entirely surprised to find the future Lord Greystoke fully dressed for the street and about to crawl from his open bedroom window. Mr. Moore made a rapid spring across the apartment, but the waste of energy was unnecessary, for when the boy heard him within the chamber and realized that he had been discovered he turned back as though to relinquish his planned adventure. Where were you going? panted the excited Mr. Moore. I am going to see Arjux, replied the boy, quietly. I am astonished, cried Mr. Moore, but a moment later he was infinitely more astonished, for the boy, approaching close to him, suddenly seized him about the waist, lifted him from his feet and threw him face downward upon the bed, shoving his face deep into a soft pillow. Be quiet, admonished the victor, or I'll choke you. Mr. Moore struggled, but his efforts were in vain. Whatever else Tarzan of the Apes may or may not have handed down to his son he had at least bequeathed him almost as marvellous a physique as he himself had possessed at the same age. The tutor was as putty in the boy's hands. Kneeling upon him, Jack tore strips from a sheet and bound the man's hands behind his back. Then he rolled him over and stuffed a gag of the same material between his teeth, securing it with a strip wound about the back of his victim's head. All the while he talked in a low, conversational tone. I am Waja, chief of the Waji, he explained, and you are Mohammed Dubn, the Arab Sheikh who would murder my people and steal my ivory, and he dexterously trussed Mr. Moore's hobbled ankles up behind to meet his hobbled wrists. Aha! Uh -huh. Villain! I have you in me power at last. I go, but I shall return. And the son of Tarzan skipped across the room, slipped through the open window, and slid to liberty by way of the downspout from an eaves trough. Mr. Moore wriggled and struggled about the bed. He was sure that he should suffocate unless aid came quickly. In his frenzy of terror he managed to roll off the bed. The pain and shock of the fall jolted him back to something like sane consideration of his plight. Where before he had been unable to think intelligently because of the hysterical fear that had claimed him he now lay quietly searching for some means of escape from his dilemma. It finally occurred to him that the room in which Lord and Lady Greystoke had been sitting when he left them was directly beneath that in which he lay upon the floor. He knew that some time had elapsed since he had come upstairs and that they might be gone by this time, for it seemed to him that he had struggled about the bed, in his efforts to free himself, for an eternity. But the best that he could do was to attempt to attract attention from below, 
And so, after many failures, he managed to work himself into a position in which he could tap the toe of his boot against the floor. This he proceeded to do at short intervals, until, after what seemed a very long time, he was rewarded by hearing footsteps ascending the stairs, and presently a knock upon the door. Mr. Moore tapped vigorously with his toe, he could not reply in any other way. The knock was repeated after a moment's silence. Again Mr. Moore tapped. Would they never open the door? Laboriously he rolled in the direction of succor. If he could get his back against the door he could then tap upon its base, when surely he must be heard. The knocking was repeated a little louder, and finally a voice called, Mr. Jack. It was one of the housemen Mr. Moore recognized the fellow's voice. He came near to bursting a blood vessel in an endeavor to scream come in through the stifling gag. After a moment the man knocked again, quite loudly, and again called the boy's name. Receiving no reply he turned the knob, and at the same instant a sudden recollection filled the tutor anew with numbing terror, he had, himself, locked the door behind him when he had entered the room. He heard the servant try the door several times and then depart. Upon which Mr. Moore swooned. In the meantime Jack was enjoying to the full the stolen pleasures of the music hall. He had reached the Temple of Mirth just as Arjux's act was commencing, and having purchased a box seat was now leaning breathlessly over the rail watching every move of the great ape, his eyes wide in wonder. The trainer was not slow to note the boy's handsome, eager face, and as one of Arjux's biggest hits consisted in an entry to one or more boxes during his performance, ostensibly in search of a long-lost relative, as the trainer explained, the man realized the effectiveness of sending him into the box with the handsome boy, who, doubtless, would be terror-stricken by proximity to the shaggy, powerful beast. When the time came, therefore, for the ape to return from the wings in reply to an encore the trainer directed its attention to the boy who chanced to be the sole occupant of the box in which he sat today. With a spring the huge anthropoid leaped from the stage to the boy's side, but if the trainer had looked for a laughable scene of fright he was mistaken. A broad smile lighted the boy's features as he laid his hand upon the shaggy arm of his visitor. The ape, grasping the boy by either shoulder, peered long and earnestly into his face, while the latter stroked his head and talked to him in a low voice. Never had Arjux devoted so long a time to an examination of another as he did in this instance. He seemed troubled and not a little excited, jabbering and mumbling to the boy, and now caressing him as the trainer had never seen him caress a human being before. Presently he clambered over into the box with him and snuggled down close to the boy's side. The audience was delighted, but they were still more delighted when the trainer, the period of his act having elapsed, attempted to persuade Arjux to leave the box. The ape would not budge. The manager, becoming excited at the delay, urged the trainer to greater haste but when the latter entered the box to drag away the reluctant Arjux he was met by bared fangs and menacing growls. The audience was delirious with joy. They cheered the ape. They cheered the boy, and they hooted and jeered at the trainer and the manager, which luckless individual had inadvertently shown himself and attempted to assist the trainer. Finally, reduced to desperation and realizing that this show of mutiny upon the part of his valuable possession might render the animal worthless for exhibition purposes in the future if not immediately subdued, the trainer had hastened to his dressing room and procured a heavy whip. With this he now returned to the box, but when he had threatened Arjux with it but once he found himself facing two infuriated enemies instead of one, for the boy had leaped to his feet, and seizing a chair was standing ready at the ape's side to defend his newfound friend. There was no longer a smile upon his handsome face. In his grey eyes was an expression which gave the train a pause, and beside him stood the giant anthropoid growling and ready. What might have happened, but for a timely interruption, may only be surmised, but that the trainer would have received a severe mauling, if nothing more, was clearly indicated by the attitudes of the two who faced him. It was a pale-faced man who rushed into the Greystoke library to announce that he had found Jack's door locked and had been able to obtain no response to his repeated knocking and calling other than a strange tapping and the sound of what might have been a body moving about upon the floor. 
For steps at a time John Clayton took the stairs that led to the floor above. His wife and the servant hurried after him. Once he called his son's name in a loud voice, but receiving no reply he launched his great weight, backed by all the undiminished power of his giant muscles, against the heavy door. With a snapping of iron butts and a splintering of wood the obstacle burst inward. At its foot lay the body of the unconscious Mr. Moore, across whom it fell with a resounding thud. Through the opening leaped Tarzan, and a moment later the room was flooded with light from a dozen electric bulbs. It was several minutes before the tutor was discovered, so completely had the door covered him, but finally he was dragged forth, his gag and bonds cut away, and a liberal application of cold water had hastened returning consciousness. Where is Jack? was John Clayton's first question, and then, who did this, as the memory of Rokoff and the fear of a second abduction seized him. Slowly Mr. Moore staggered to his feet. His gaze wandered about the room. Gradually he collected his scattered wits. The details of his recent harrowing experience returned to him. I tender my resignation, sir, to take effect at once, were his first words. You do not need a tutor for your son, what he needs is a wild animal trainer. But where is he? cried Lady Greystoke. He has gone to see our jocks. It was with difficulty that Tarzan restrained a smile, and after satisfying himself that the tutor was more scared than injured, he ordered his closed car around and departed in the direction of a certain well-known music hall. Chapter 3 As the trainer, with raised lash, hesitated an instant at the entrance to the box where the boy and the ape confronted him, a tall broad-shouldered man pushed past him and entered. As his eyes fell upon the newcomer a slight flush mounted the boy's cheeks. Father, he exclaimed. The ape gave one look at the English lord, and then leaped toward him, calling out in excited jabbering. The man, his eyes going wide in astonishment, stopped as though turned to stone. Akat, he cried. The boy looked, bewildered, from the ape to his father, and from his father to the ape. The trainer's jaw dropped as he listened to what followed, for from the lips of the Englishman flowed the gutturals of an ape that were answered in kind by the huge anthropoid that now clung to him. And from the wings a hideously bent and disfigured old man watched the tableau in the box, his pockmarked features working spasmodically in varying expressions that might have marked every sensation in the gamut from pleasure to terror. Long have I looked for you, Tarzan, said Akat. Now that I have found you I shall come to your jungle and live there always. The man stroked the beast's head. Through his mind there was running rapidly a train of recollection that carried him far into the depths of the primeval African forest where this huge, man-like beast had fought shoulder to shoulder with him years before. He saw the black Mugambi wielding his deadly knobstick, and beside them, with bared fangs and bristling whiskers, Shieta the terrible, and pressing close behind the savage and the savage panther, the hideous apes of Akat. The man sighed. Strong within him surged the jungle lust that he had thought dead. Ah! If he could go back even for a brief month of it, to feel again the brush of leafy branches against his naked hide, to smell the musty rot of dead vegetation, frankincense and matter the jungle born, to sense the noiseless coming of the great carnivora upon his trail, to hunt and to be hunted, to kill, the picture was alluring. And then came another picture, a sweet-faced woman, still young and beautiful, friends, a home, a son. He shrugged his giant shoulders. It cannot be, Akut, he said, but if you would return, I shall see that it is done. You could not be happy here, I may not be happy there. The trainer stepped forward. The ape bared his fangs, growling. Go with him, Akut, said Tarzan of the apes. I will come and see you tomorrow. The beast moved sullenly to the trainer's side. The latter, at John Clayton's request, told where they might be found. Tarzan turned toward his son. Come, he said, and the two left the theatre. Neither spoke for several minutes after they had entered the limousine. It was the boy who broke the silence. 
The ape knew you, he said, and you spoke together in the ape's tongue. How did the ape know you, and how did you learn his language? And then, briefly and for the first time, Tarzan of the apes told his son of his early life of the birth in the jungle, of the death of his parents, and of how Kala, the great she-ape had suckled and raised him from infancy almost to manhood. He told him, too, of the dangers and the horrors of the jungle, of the great beasts that stalked one by day and by night, of the periods of drought, and of the cataclysmic rains, of hunger, of cold, of intense heat, of nakedness and fear and suffering. He told him of all those things that seem most horrible to the creature of civilization in the hope that the knowledge of them might expunge from the lad's mind any inherent desire for the jungle. Yet they were the very things that made the memory of the jungle what it was to Tarzan that made up the composite jungle life he loved. And in the telling he forgot one thing, the principal thing, that the boy at his side, listening with eager ears, was the son of Tarzan of the apes. After the boy had been tucked away in bed and without the threatened punishment, John Clayton told his wife of the events of the evening, and that he had at last acquainted the boy with the facts of his jungle life. The mother, who had long foreseen that her son must sometime know of those frightful years during which his father had roamed the jungle, a naked, savage beast of prey, only shook her head, hoping against hope that the law she knew was still strong in the father's breast had not been transmitted to his son. Tarzan visited Akut the following day, but though Jack begged to be allowed to accompany him he was refused. This time Tarzan saw the pockmarked old owner of the ape, whom he did not recognize as the wily Paulvich of former days. Tarzan, influenced by Akut's pleadings, broached the question of the ape's purchase, but Paulvich would not name any price, saying that he would consider the matter. When Tarzan returned home Jack was all excitement to hear the details of his visit, and finally suggested that his father buy the ape and bring it home. Lady Greystoke was horrified at the suggestion. The boy was insistent. Tarzan explained that he had wished to purchase Akut and return him to his jungle home, and to this the mother assented. Jack asked to be allowed to visit the ape, but again he was met with flat refusal. He had the address, however, which the trainer had given his father, and two days later he found the opportunity to elude his new tutor who had replaced the terrified Mr. Moore and after a considerable search through a section of London which he had never before visited, he found the smelly little quarters of the pockmarked old man. The old fellow himself replied to his knocking, and when he stated that he had come to see Arjux, opened the door and admitted him to the little room which he and the great ape occupied. In former years Paulvich had been a fastidious scoundrel, but ten years of hideous life among the cannibals of Africa had eradicated the last vestige of niceness from his habits. His apparel was wrinkled and soiled. His hands were unwashed, his few straggling locks uncombed. His room was a jumble of filthy disorder. As the boy entered he saw the great ape squatting upon the bed, the coverlets of which were a tangled wad of filthy blankets and ill-smelling quilts. At sight of the youth the ape leaped to the floor and shuffled forward. The man, not recognizing his visitor and fearing that the ape meant mischief, stepped between them, ordering the ape back to the bed. He will not hurt me, cried the boy. We are friends, and before, he was my father's friend. They knew one another in the jungle. My father is Lord Greystoke. He does not know that I have come here. My mother forbid my coming, but I wish to see Arjux, and I will pay you if you will let me come here often and see him. At the mention of the boy's identity Paulvich's eyes narrowed. Since he had first seen Tarzan again from the wings of the theatre there had been forming in his deadened brain the beginnings of a desire for revenge. It is a characteristic of the weak and criminal to attribute to others the misfortunes that are the result of their own wickedness, and so now it was that Alexis Paulvich was slowly recalling the events of his past life and as he did so laying at the door of the man whom he and Rokoff had so assiduously attempted to ruin and murder all the misfortunes that had befallen him in the failure of their various schemes against their intended victim. He saw at first no way in which he could, with safety to himself, wreak vengeance upon Tarzan through the medium of Tarzan's son, but that great possibilities for revenge lay in the boy was apparent to him, and so he determined to cultivate the lad in the hope that fate would play into his hands in some way in the future. 
He told the boy all that he knew of his father's past life in the jungle and when he found that the boy had been kept in ignorance of all these things for so many years, and that he had been forbidden visiting the zoological gardens, that he had had to bind and gag his tutor to find an opportunity to come to the music hall and see Arjux. He guessed immediately the nature of the great fear that lay in the hearts of the boy's parents, that he might crave the jungle as his father had craved it. And so Paulvich encouraged the boy to come and see him often, and always he played upon the lad's craving for tales of the savage world with which Paulvich was all too familiar. He left him alone with Akut much, and it was not long until he was surprised to learn that the boy could make the great beast understand him, that he had actually learned many of the words of the primitive language of the anthropoids. During this period Tarzan came several times to visit Paulvich. He seemed anxious to purchase Arjux, and at last he told the man frankly that he was prompted not only by desire upon his part to return the beast to the liberty of his native jungle, but also because his wife feared that in some way her son might learn the whereabouts of the ape and through his attachment for the beast become imbued with the roving instinct which, as Tarzan explained to Paulvich, had so influenced his own life. The Russian could scarce repress a smile as he listened to Lord Greystoke's words since scarce a half-hour had passed since the time the future Lord Greystoke had been sitting upon the disordered bed jabbering away to Arjux with all the fluency of a born ape. It was during this interview that a plan occurred to Paulvich, and as a result of it he agreed to accept a certain fabulous sum for the ape, and upon receipt of the money to deliver the beast to a vessel that was sailing south from Dover for Africa two days later. He had a double purpose in accepting Clayton's offer. Primarily, the money consideration influenced him strongly, as the ape was no longer a source of revenue to him, having consistently refused to perform upon the stage after having discovered Tarzan. It was as though the beast had suffered himself to be brought from his jungle home and exhibited before thousands of curious spectators for the sole purpose of searching out his long-lost friend and master, and, having found him, considered further mingling with the common herd of humans unnecessary. However that may be, the fact remained that no amount of persuasion could influence him even to show himself upon the music hall stage, and upon the single occasion that the trainer attempted force the results were such that the unfortunate man considered himself lucky to have escaped with his life. All that saved him was the accidental presence of Jack Clayton, who had been permitted to visit the animal in the dressing room reserved for him at the music hall, and had immediately interfered when he saw that the savage beast meant serious mischief. And after the money consideration, strong in the heart of the Russian was the desire for revenge, which had been growing with constant brooding over the failures and miseries of his life, which he attributed to Tarzan, the latest, and by no means the least, of which was Arjux's refusal to longer earn money for him. The ape's refusal he traced directly to Tarzan, finally convincing himself that the ape man had instructed the great anthropoid to refuse to go upon the stage. Paulvich's naturally malign disposition was aggravated by the weakening and warping of his mental and physical faculties through torture and privation. From cold, calculating, highly intelligent perversity it had deteriorated into the indiscriminating, dangerous menace of the mentally defective. His plan, however, was sufficiently cunning to at least cast a doubt upon the assertion that his mentality was wandering. It assured him first of the competence which Lord Greystoke had promised to pay him for the deportation of the ape, and then of revenge upon his benefactor through the son he idolized. That part of his scheme was crude and brutal it lacked the refinement of torture that had marked the masterstrokes of the Paulvich of old, when he had worked with that virtuoso of villainy, Nicholas Rokoff, but it at least assured Paulvich of immunity from responsibility, placing that upon the ape, who would thus also be punished for his refusal longer to support the Russian. Everything played with fiendish unanimity into Paulvich's hands. As chance would have it, Tarzan's son overheard his father relating to the boy's mother the steps he was taking to return Akut safely to his jungle home, and having overheard he begged them to bring the ape home that he might have him for a playfellow. Tarzan would not have been averse to this plan, but Lady Greystoke was horrified at the very thought of it. Jack pleaded with his mother, but all unavailingly. She was obdurate, and at last the lad appeared to acquiesce in his mother's decision that the ape must be returned to Africa and the boy to school, 
from which he had been absent on vacation. He did not attempt to visit Paul Vich's room again that day, but instead busied himself in other ways. He had always been well supplied with money, so that when necessity demanded he had no difficulty in collecting several hundred pounds. Some of this money he invested in various strange purchases which he managed to smuggle into the house, undetected, when he returned late in the afternoon. The next morning, after giving his father time to precede him and conclude his business with Paulvich, the lad hastened to the Russian's room. Knowing nothing of the man's true character the boy dared not take him fully into his confidence for fear that the old fellow would not only refuse to aid him, but would report the whole affair to his father. Instead, he simply asked permission to take Arjux to Dover. He explained that it would relieve the old man of a tiresome journey, as well as placing a number of pounds in his pocket, for the lad purposed paying the Russian well. You see, he went on, there will be no danger of detection since I am supposed to be leaving on an afternoon train for school. Instead I will come here after they have left me on board the train. Then I can take Arjux to Dover, you see and arrive at school only a day late. No one will be the wiser, no harm will be done, and I shall have had an extra day with Arjux before I lose him forever. The plan fitted perfectly with that which Paulvich had in mind. Had he known what further the boy contemplated he would doubtless have entirely abandoned his own scheme of revenge and aided the boy wholeheartedly in the consummation of the lads, which would have been better for Paulvich, could he have but read the future but a few short hours ahead. That afternoon Lord and Lady Greystoke bid their son goodbye and saw him safely settled in a first-class compartment of the railway carriage that would set him down at school in a few hours. No sooner had they left him, however, than he gathered his bags together, descended from the compartment and sought a cab stand outside the station. Here he engaged a cabbie to take him to the Russian's address. It was dusk when he arrived. He found Paulvich awaiting him. The man was pacing the floor nervously. The ape was tied with a stout cord to the bed. It was the first time that Jack had ever seen Arjux thus secured. He looked questioningly at Paulvich. The man, mumbling, explained that he believed the animal had guessed that he was to be sent away and he feared he would attempt to escape. Paulvich carried another piece of cord in his hand. There was a noose in one end of it which he was continually playing with. He walked back and forth, up and down the room. His pockmarked features were working horribly as he talked silent to himself. The boy had never seen him thus, it made him uneasy. At last Paulvich stopped on the opposite side of the room, far from the ape. Come here, he said to the lad. I will show you how to secure the ape should he show signs of rebellion during the trip. The lad laughed. It will not be necessary he replied. Arjux will do whatever I tell him to do. The old man stamped his foot angrily. Come here, as I tell you, he repeated. If you do not do as I say you shall not accompany the ape to Dover, I will take no chances upon his escaping. Still smiling, the lad crossed the room and stood before the Russ. Turn around, with your back toward me, directed the latter, that I may show you how to bind him quickly. The boy did as he was bid, placing his hands behind him when Paulvich told him to do so. Instantly the old man slipped the running noose over one of the lad's wrists, took a couple of half hitches about his other wrist, and knotted the cord. The moment that the boy was secured the attitude of the man changed. With an angry oath he wheeled his prisoner about, tripped him and hurled him violently to the floor leaping upon his breast as he fell. From the bed the ape growled and struggled with his bonds. The boy did not cry out, a trait inherited from his savage sire whom long years in the jungle following the death of his foster mother, Kala the great ape, had taught that there was none to come to the succour of the fallen. Paulvich's fingers sought the lad's throat. He grinned down horribly into the face of his victim. Your father ruined me, he mumbled. This will pay him. He will think that the ape did it. I will tell him that the ape did it. That I left him alone for a few minutes, and that you sneaked in and the ape killed you. I will throw your body upon the bed after I have choked the life from you, 
and when I bring your father he will see the ape squatting over it, and the twisted fiend cackled in gloating laughter. His fingers closed upon the boy's throat. Behind them the growling of the maddened beast reverberated against the walls of the little room. The boy paled, but no other sign of fear or panic showed upon his countenance. He was the son of Tarzan. The fingers tightened their grip upon his throat. It was with difficulty that he breathed, gaspingly. The ape lunged against the stout cord that held him. Turning, he wrapped the cord about his hands, as a man might have done, and surged heavily backward. The great muscles stood out beneath his shaggy hide. There was a rending as of splintered wood the cord held, but a portion of the footboard of the bed came away. At the sound Paulvich looked up. His hideous face went white with terror, the ape was free. With a single bound the creature was upon him. The man shrieked. The brute wrenched him from the body of the boy. Great fingers sunk into the man's flesh. Yellow fangs gaped close to his throat, he struggled, futilely, and when they closed, the soul of Alexis Paulvich passed into the keeping of the demons who had long been awaiting it. The boy struggled to his feet, assisted by Akut. For two hours under the instructions of the former the ape worked upon the knots that secured his friend's wrists. Finally they gave up their secret, and the boy was free. Then he opened one of his bags and drew forth some garments. His plans had been well made. He did not consult the beast, which did all that he directed. Together they slunk from the house, but no casual observer might have noted that one of them was an ape. Chapter 4 The killing of the friendless old Russian, Michael Sabrove, by his great trained ape, was a matter for newspaper comment for a few days. Lord Greystoke read of it, and while taking special precautions not to permit his name to become connected with the affair, kept himself well posted as to the police search for the anthropoid. As was true of the general public, his chief interest in the matter centred about the mysterious disappearance of the Slayer. Or at least this was true until he learned, several days subsequent to the tragedy, that his son Jack had not reported at the public school en route for which they had seen him safely ensconced in a railway carriage. Even then the father did not connect the disappearance of his son with the mystery surrounding the whereabouts of the ape. Nor was it until a month later that careful investigation revealed the fact that the boy had left the train before it pulled out of the station at London, and the cab driver had been found who had driven him to the address of the old Russian, that Tarzan of the apes realised that Akut had in some way been connected with the disappearance of the boy. Beyond the moment that the cab driver had deposited his fare beside the curb in front of the house in which the Russian had been quartered there was no clue. No one had seen either the boy or the ape from that instant, at least no one who still lived. The proprietor of the house identified the picture of the lad as that of one who had been a frequent visitor in the room of the old man. Aside from this he knew nothing. And there, at the door of a grimy, old building in the slums of London, the searchers came to a blank wall, baffled. The day following the death of Alexis Paulvich a youth accompanying his invalid grandmother, boarded a steamer at Dover. The old lady was heavily veiled, and so weakened by age and sickness that she had to be wheeled aboard the vessel in an invalid chair. The boy would permit none but himself to wheel her, and with his own hands assisted her from the chair to the interior of their stateroom and that was the last that was seen of the old lady by the ship's company until the pair disembarked. The boy even insisted upon doing the work of their cabin steward, since, as he explained, his grandmother was suffering from a nervous disposition that made the presence of strangers extremely distasteful to her. Outside the cabin, and none there was aboard who knew what he did in the cabin, the lad was just as any other healthy, normal English boy might have been. He mingled with his fellow passengers, became a prime favourite with the officers, and struck up numerous friendships among the common sailors. He was generous and unaffected, yet carried an air of dignity and strength of character that inspired his many new friends with admiration as well as affection for him. Among the passengers there was an American named Condon, a noted blackleg and crook who was wanted in a half-dozen of the larger cities of the United States. He had paid little attention to the boy until on one occasion he had seen him accidentally display a roll of banknotes. 
From then on Condon cultivated the youthful Britain. He learned, easily, that the boy was travelling alone with his invalid grandmother, and that their destination was a small port on the west coast of Africa, a little below the equator, that their name was Billings, and that they had no friends in the little settlement for which they were bound. Upon the point of their purpose in visiting the place Condon found the boy reticent, and so he did not push the matter, he had learned all that he cared to know as it was. Several times Condon attempted to draw the lad into a card game, but his victim was not interested, and the black looks of several of the other men passengers decided the American to find other means of transferring the boy's bankroll to his own pocket. At last came the day that the steamer dropped anchor in the lee of a wooded promontory where a score or more of sheet iron shacks making an unsightly blot upon the fair face of nature proclaimed the fact that civilization had set its heel. Straggling upon the outskirts were the thatched huts of natives, picturesque in their primeval savagery, harmonizing with the background of tropical jungle and accentuating the squalid hideousness of the white man's pioneer architecture. The boy, leaning over the rail, was looking far beyond the man-made town deep into the god-made jungle. A little shiver of anticipation tingled his spine, and then, quite without volition, he found himself gazing into the loving eyes of his mother and the strong face of the father which mirrored, beneath its masculine strength, a love no less than the mother's eyes proclaimed. He felt himself weakening in his resolve. Nearby one of the ship's officers was shouting orders to a flotilla of native boats that was approaching to lighter the consignment of the steamer's cargo destined for this tiny post. When does the next steamer for England touch here? the boy asked. The Emmanuel ought to be along most any time now, replied the officer. I figured we'd find her here, and he went on with his bellowing remarks to the dusty horde drawing close to the steamer side. The task of lowering the boy's grandmother over the side to a waiting canoe was rather difficult. The lad insisted on being always at her side, and when at last she was safely ensconced in the bottom of the craft that was to bear them shoreward her grandson dropped cat-like after her. So interested was he in seeing her comfortably disposed that he failed to notice the little package that had worked from his pocket as he assisted in lowering the sling that contained the old woman over the steamer's side, nor did he notice it even as it slipped out entirely and dropped into the sea. Scarcely had the boat containing the boy and the old woman started for the shore than Condon hailed a canoe upon the other side of the ship, and after bargaining with its owner finally lowered his baggage and himself aboard. Once ashore he kept out of sight of the two-story atrocity that bore the legend hotel to lure unsuspecting wayfarers to its multitudinous discomforts. It was quite dark before he ventured to enter and arrange for accommodations. In a back room upon the second floor the lad was explaining, not without considerable difficulty, to his grandmother that he had decided to return to England upon the next steamer. He was endeavouring to make it plain to the old lady that she might remain in Africa if she wished but that for his part his conscience demanded that he return to his father and mother, who doubtless were even now suffering untold sorrow because of his absence, from which it may be assumed that his parents had not been acquainted with the plans that he and the old lady had made for their adventure into African wilds. Having come to a decision the lad felt a sense of relief from the worry that had haunted him for many sleepless nights. When he closed his eyes in sleep it was to dream of a happy reunion with those at home. And as he dreamed, fate, cruel and inexorable, crept stealthily upon him through the dark corridor of the squalid building in which he slept, fate in the form of the American crook, Condon. Cautiously the man approached the door of the lad's room. There he crouched listening until assured by the regular breathing of those within that both slept. Quietly he inserted a slim, skeleton key in the lock of the door. With deft fingers, long accustomed to the silent manipulation of the bars and bolts that guarded other men's property, Condon turned the key and the knob simultaneously. Gentle pressure upon the door swung it slowly inward upon its hinges. The man entered the room, closing the door behind him. The moon was temporarily overcast by heavy clouds. The interior of the apartment was shrouded in gloom. Condon groped his way toward the bed. In the far corner of the room something moved, moved with a silent stealthiness which transcended even the trained silence of the burglar. Condon heard nothing. 
His attention was riveted upon the bed in which he thought to find a young boy and his helpless, invalid grandmother. The American sought only the bank roll. If he could possess himself of this without detection, well and good, but were he to meet resistance he was prepared for that too. The lad's clothes lay across a chair beside the bed. The American's fingers felt swiftly through them, the pockets contained no roll of crisp, new notes. Doubtless they were beneath the pillows of the bed. He stepped closer toward the sleeper, his hand was already halfway beneath the pillow when the thick cloud that had obscured the moon rolled aside and the room was flooded with light. At the same instant the boy opened his eyes and looked straight into those of Condon. The man was suddenly conscious that the boy was alone in the bed. Then he clutched for his victim's throat. As the lad rose to meet him Condon heard a low growl at his back, then he felt his wrists seized by the boy, and realized that beneath those tapering, white fingers played muscles of steel. He felt other hands at his throat, rough hairy hands that reached over his shoulders from behind. He cast a terrified glance backward, and the hairs of his head stiffened at the sight his eyes revealed, for grasping him from the rear was a huge, manlike ape. The bared fighting fangs of the anthropoid were close to his throat. The lad pinioned his wrists. Neither uttered a sound. Where was the grandmother? Condon's eyes swept the room in a single all-inclusive glance. His eyes bulged in horror at the realization of the truth which that glance revealed. In the power of what creatures of hideous mystery had he placed himself? Frantically he fought to beat off the lad that he might turn upon the fearsome thing at his back. Freeing one hand he struck a savage blow at the lad's face. His act seemed to unloose a thousand devils in the hairy creature clinging to his throat. Condon heard a low and savage snarl. It was the last thing that the American ever heard in this life. Then he was dragged backward upon the floor, a heavy body fell upon him, powerful teeth fastened themselves in his jugular, his head whirled in the sudden blackness which rims eternity a moment later the ape rose from his prostrate form, but Condon did not know he was quite dead. The lad, horrified, sprang from the bed to lean over the body of the man. He knew that Akut had killed in his defense, as he had killed Michael Sabrove, but here, in savage Africa, far from home and friends what would they do to him and his faithful ape? The lad knew that the penalty of murder was death. He even knew that an accomplice might suffer the death penalty with the principal. Who was there who would plead for them? All would be against them. It was little more than a half-civilized community and the chances were that they would drag Akut and him forth in the morning and hang them both to the nearest tree, he had read of such things being done in America, and Africa was worse even and wilder than the great west of his mother's native land. Yes, they would both be hanged in the morning. Was there no escape? He thought in silence for a few moments, and then, with an exclamation of relief, he struck his palms together and turned toward his clothing upon the chair. Money would do anything. Money would save him an Akut. He felt for the bank roll in the pocket in which he had been accustomed to carry it. It was not there. Slowly at first and at last frantically he searched through the remaining pockets of his clothing. Then he dropped upon his hands and knees and examined the floor. Lighting the lamp he moved the bed to one side and, inch by inch, he felt over the entire floor. Beside the body of Condon he hesitated, but at last he nerved himself to touch it. Rolling it over he sought beneath it for the money. Nor was it there. He guessed that Condon had entered their room to rob, but he did not believe that the man had had time to possess himself of the money, however, as it was nowhere else, it must be upon the body of the dead man. Again and again he went over the room, only to return each time to the corpse, but nowhere could he find the money. He was half frantic with despair. What were they to do? In the morning they would be discovered and killed. For all his inherited size and strength he was, after all, only a little boy a frightened, homesick little boy reasoning faultily from the meagre experience of childhood. He could think of but a single glaring fact, they had killed a fellow man, and they were among savage strangers, thirsting for the blood of the first victim whom fate cast into their clutches. This much he had gleaned from Penadreadfuls. 
and they must have money. Again he approached the corpse. This time resolutely. The ape squatted in a corner watching his young companion. The youth commenced to remove the American's clothing piece by piece, and, piece by piece, he examined each garment minutely. Even to the shoes he searched with painstaking care, and when the last article had been removed and scrutinized he dropped back upon the bed with dilated eyes that saw nothing in the present only a grim tableau of the future in which two forms swung silently from the limb of a great tree. How long he sat thus he did not know, but finally he was aroused by a noise coming from the floor below. Springing quickly to his feet he blew out the lamp, and crossing the floor silently locked the door. Then he turned toward the ape, his mind made up. Last evening he had been determined to start for home at the first opportunity, to beg the forgiveness of his parents for this mad adventure. Now he knew that he might never return to them. The blood of a fellow man was upon his hands, in his morbid reflections he had long since ceased to attribute the death of Condon to the ape. The hysteria of panic had fastened the guilt upon himself. With money he might have bought justice, but penniless, ah, what hope could there be for strangers without money here? But what had become of the money? He tried to recall when last he had seen it. He could not, nor, could he, would he have been able to account for its disappearance, for he had been entirely unconscious of the falling of the little package from his pocket into the sea as he clambered over the ship's side into the waiting canoe that bore him to shore. Now he turned toward Akut. Come, he said, in the language of the great apes. Forgetful of the fact that he wore only a thin pyjama suit he led the way to the open window. Thrusting his head out he listened attentively. A single tree grew a few feet from the window. Nimbly the lad sprang to its bowl, clinging cat-like for an instant before he clambered quietly to the ground below. Close behind him came the great ape. Two hundred yards away a spur of the jungle ran close to the straggling town. Toward this the lad led the way. None saw them, and a moment later the jungle swallowed them, and John Clayton, future Lord Greystoke, passed from the eyes and the knowledge of men. It was late the following morning that a native houseman knocked upon the door of the room that had been assigned to Mrs. Billings and her grandson. Receiving no response he inserted his pass key in the lock, only to discover that another key was already there, but from the inside. He reported the fact to Herr Skopf, the proprietor, who at once made his way to the second floor where he, too, pounded vigorously upon the door. Receiving no reply he bent to the keyhole in an attempt to look through into the room beyond. In so doing, being portly, he lost his balance, which necessitated putting a palm to the floor to maintain his equilibrium. As he did so he felt something soft and thick and wet beneath his fingers. He raised his open palm before his eyes in the dim light of the corridor and peered at it. Then he gave a little shudder, for even in the semi-darkness he saw a dark red stain upon his hand. Leaping to his feet he hurled his shoulder against the door. Herr Skopf is a heavy man, or at least he was then, I have not seen him for several years. The frail door collapsed beneath his weight, and Herr Skopf stumbled precipitately into the room beyond. Before him lay the greatest mystery of his life. Upon the floor at his feet was the dead body of a strange man. The neck was broken and the jugular severed as by the fangs of a wild beast. The body was entirely naked, the clothing being strewn about the corpse. The old lady and her grandson were gone. The window was open. They must have disappeared through the window for the door had been locked from the inside. But how could the boy have carried his invalid grandmother from a second-story window to the ground? It was preposterous. Again Herr Skopf searched the small room. He noticed that the bed was pulled well away from the wall, why? He looked beneath it again for the third or fourth time. The two were gone, and yet his judgment told him that the old lady could not have gone without porters to carry her down as they had carried her up the previous day. Further search deepened the mystery. All the clothing of the two was still in the room, if they had gone then they must have gone naked or in their night clothes. Herr Skopf shook his head, then he scratched it. He was baffled. 
He had never heard of Sherlock Holmes or he would have lost no time in invoking the aid of that celebrated sleuth, for here was a real mystery, an old woman an invalid who had to be carried from the ship to her room in the hotel and a handsome lad, her grandson, had entered a room on the second floor of his hostelry the day before. They had had their evening meal served in their room that was the last that had been seen of them. At nine the following morning the corpse of a strange man had been the sole occupant of that room. No boat had left the harbour in the meantime, there was not a railroad within hundreds of miles, there was no other white settlement that the two could reach under several days of arduous marching accompanied by a well-equipped safari. They had simply vanished into thin air, for the native he had sent to inspect the ground beneath the open window had just returned to report that there was no sign of a footstep there, and what sort of creatures were they who could have dropped that distance to the soft turf without leaving spore? Herr Skopf shuddered. Yes, it was a great mystery, there was something uncanny about the whole thing, he hated to think about it, and he dreaded the coming of night. It was a great mystery to Herr Skopf, and, doubtless, still is. Chapter 5 Captain Armand Jacot of the Foreign Legion sat upon an outspread saddle blanket at the foot of a stunted palm tree. His broad shoulders and his close-cropped head rested in luxurious ease against the rough bowl of the palm. His long legs were stretched straight before him overlapping the meagre blanket, his spurs buried in the sandy soil of the little desert oasis. The captain was taking his ease after a long day of weary riding across the shifting sands of the desert. Lazily he puffed upon his cigarette and watched his orderly who was preparing his evening meal. Captain Armand Jacot was well satisfied with himself and the world. A little to his right rose the noisy activity of his troop of sun-tanned veterans, released for the time from the irksome trammels of discipline, relaxing tired muscles, laughing, joking, and smoking as they, too, prepared to eat after a twelve-hour fast. Among them, silent and taciturn, squatted five white-robed Arabs, securely bound and under heavy guard. It was the sight of these that filled Captain Armand Jacot with the pleasurable satisfaction of a duty well performed. For a long, hot, gaunt month he and his little troop had scoured the places of the desert waste in search of a band of marauders to the sin-stained account of which were charged innumerable thefts of camels, horses, and goats, as well as murders enough to have sent the whole unsavory gang to the guillotine several times over. A week before, he had come upon them. In the ensuing battle he had lost two of his own men, but the punishment inflicted upon the marauders had been severe almost to extinction. A half-dozen, perhaps, had escaped, but the balance, with the exception of the five prisoners, had expiated their crimes before the nickel-jacketed bullets of the legionaries. And, best of all, the ring leader, Akhmet ben Houdin, was among the prisoners. From the prisoners Captain Jacob permitted his mind to traverse the remaining miles of sand to the little garrison post where, upon the morrow, he should find awaiting him with eager welcome his wife and little daughter. His eyes softened to the memory of them, as they always did. Even now he could see the beauty of the mother reflected in the childish lines of little Jean's face, and both those faces would be smiling up into his as he swung from his tired mount late the following afternoon. Already he could feel a soft cheek pressed close to each of his velvet against leather. His reverie was broken in upon by the voice of a sentry summoning a non-commissioned officer. Captain Jacob raised his eyes. The sun had not yet set, but the shadows of the few trees huddled about the water hole and of his men and their horses stretched far away into the east across the now golden sand. The sentry was pointing in this direction, and the corporal, through narrowed lids, was searching the distance. Captain Jacob rose to his feet. He was not a man content to see through the eyes of others. He must see for himself. Usually he saw things long before others were aware that there was anything to see, a trait that had won for him the sobriquet of Hawk. Now he saw, just beyond the long shadows, a dozen specks rising and falling among the sands. They disappeared and reappeared, but always they grew larger. Jacob recognized them immediately. They were horsemen, horsemen of the desert. Already a sergeant was running toward him. The entire camp was straining its eyes into the distance. Jacob gave a few terse orders to the sergeant who saluted, 
turned upon his heel and returned to the men. Here he gathered a dozen who saddled their horses, mounted and rode out to meet the strangers. The remaining men disposed themselves in readiness for instant action. It was not entirely beyond the range of possibilities that the horsemen riding thus swiftly toward the camp might be friends of the prisoners bent upon the release of their kinsmen by a sudden attack. Jacob doubted this, however, since the strangers were evidently making no attempt to conceal their presence. They were galloping rapidly toward the camp in plain view of all. There might be treachery lurking beneath their fair appearance, but none who knew the hawk would be so gullible as to hope to trap him thus. The sergeant with his detail met the Arabs two hundred yards from the camp. Jacob could see him in conversation with a tall, white-robed figure evidently the leader of the band. Presently the sergeant and this Arab rode side by side toward camp. Jacob awaited them. The two reined in and dismounted before him. Shekamor ben Kater, announced the sergeant by way of introduction. Captain Jacob eyed the newcomer. He was acquainted with nearly every principal Arab within a radius of several hundred miles. This man he never had seen. He was a tall, weather-beaten, sour-looking man of sixty or more. His eyes were narrow and evil. Captain Jacob did not relish his appearance. Well, he asked, tentatively. The Arab came directly to the point. Akmet ben Houdin is my sister's son, he said. If you will give him into my keeping I will see that he sins no more against the laws of the French. Jacob shook his head. That cannot be, he replied. I must take him back with me. He will be properly and fairly tried by a civil court. If he is innocent he will be released. And if he is not innocent, asked the Arab. He is charged with many murders. For any one of these, if he is proved guilty, he will have to die. The Arab's left hand was hidden beneath his burnous. Now he withdrew it disclosing a large goatskin purse, bulging and heavy with coins. He opened the mouth of the purse and let a handful of the contents trickle into the palm of his right hand all were pieces of good French gold. From the size of the purse and its bulging proportions Captain Jacob concluded that it must contain a small fortune. Shekamor ben Kater dropped the spilled gold pieces one by one back into the purse. Jacob was eyeing him narrowly. They were alone. The sergeant, having introduced the visitor, had withdrawn to some little distance, his back was toward them. Now the Shek, having returned all the gold pieces, held the bulging purse outward upon his open palm toward Captain Jacob. Akmet ben Houdin, my sister's son, might escape tonight, he said. A. Eh? Captain Armand Jacob flushed to the roots of his close-cropped hair. Then he went very white and took a half-step toward the Arab. His fists were clenched. Suddenly he thought better of whatever impulse was moving him. Sergeant, he called. The non-commissioned officer hurried toward him, saluting as his heels clicked together before his superior. Take this black dog back to his people, he ordered. See that they leave at once. Shoot the first man who comes within range of camp tonight. Shekamor ben Kater drew himself up to his full height. His evil eyes narrowed. He raised the bag of gold level with the eyes of the French officer. You will pay more than this for the life of Akmet ben Houdin, my sister's son, he said. And as much again for the name that you have called me and a hundredfold in sorrow in the bargain. Get out of here, growled Captain Armand Jacob, before I kick you out. All of this happened some three years before the opening of this tale. The trail of Akmet ben Houdin and his accomplices is a matter of record, you may verify it if you care to. He met the death he deserved and he met it with the stoicism of the Arab. A month later little Jean Jacot, the seven-year-old daughter of Captain Armand Jacot, mysteriously disappeared. Neither the wealth of her father and mother, or all the powerful resources of the Great Republic were able to wrest the secret of her whereabouts from the inscrutable desert that had swallowed her and her abductor.
A reward of such enormous proportions was offered that many adventurers were attracted to the hunt. This was no case for the modern detective of civilization, yet several of these threw themselves into the search, the bones of some are already bleaching beneath the African sun upon the silent sands of the Sahara. Two Swedes, Carl Jensen and Sven Malbin, after three years of following false leads at last gave up the search far to the south of the Sahara to turn their attention to the more profitable business of ivory poaching. In a great district they were already known for their relentless cruelty and their greed for ivory. The natives feared and hated them. The European governments in whose possessions they worked had long sought them, but, working their way slowly out of the north they had learned many things in the no man's land south of the Sahara which gave them immunity from capture through easy avenues of escape that were unknown to those who pursued them. Their raids were sudden and swift. They seized ivory and retreated into the trackless wastes of the north before the guardians of the territory they raped could be made aware of their presence. Relentlessly they slaughtered elephants themselves as well as stealing ivory from the natives. Their following consisted of a hundred or more renegade Arabs and Negro slaves, a fierce, relentless band of cutthroats. Remember them, Carl Jensen and Sven Malbin, yellow-bearded, Swedish giants, for you will meet them later. In the heart of the jungle, hidden away upon the banks of a small unexplored tributary of a large river that empties into the Atlantic not so far from the equator, lay a small, heavily palisaded village. Twenty palm thatched, beehive huts sheltered its black population, while a half dozen goat skin tents in the center of the clearing housed the score of Arabs who found shelter here while, by trading and raiding, they collected the cargoes which their ships of the desert bore northward twice each year to the market of Timbuktu. Playing before one of the Arab tents was a little girl of ten, a black-haired, black-eyed little girl who, with her nut-brown skin and graceful carriage looked every inch a daughter of the desert. Her little fingers were busily engaged in fashioning a skirt of grasses for a much-disheveled doll which a kindly disposed slave had made for her a year or two before. The head of the doll was rudely chipped from ivory, while the body was a rat skin stuffed with grass. The arms and legs were bits of wood, perforated at one end and sewn to the rat skin torso. The doll was quite hideous and altogether disreputable and soiled, but Miriam thought it the most beautiful and adorable thing in the whole world, which is not so strange in view of the fact that it was the only object within that world upon which she might bestow her confidence and her love. Everyone else with whom Miriam came in contact was, almost without exception, either indifferent to her or cruel. There was, for example, the old black hag who looked after her, Mabunu, toothless, filthy and ill-tempered. She lost no opportunity to cuff the little girl, or even inflict minor tortures upon her, such as pinching, or, as she had twice done, searing the tender flesh with hot coals. And there was the Shek, her father. She feared him more than she did Mabunu. He often scolded her for nothing quite habitually terminating his tirades by cruelly beating her, until her little body was black and blue. But when she was alone she was happy, playing with Gika, or decking her hair with wild flowers, or making ropes of grasses. She was always busy and always singing, when they left her alone. No amount of cruelty appeared sufficient to crush the innate happiness and sweetness from her full little heart. Only when the Shek was near was she quiet and subdued. Him she feared with a fear that was at times almost hysterical terror. She feared the gloomy jungle too, the cruel jungle that surrounded the little village with chattering monkeys and screaming birds by day and the roaring and coughing and moaning of the carnivora by night. Yes, she feared the jungle, but so much more did she fear the Shek that many times it was in her childish head to run away out into the terrible jungle forever rather than longer to face the ever-present terror of her father. As she sat there this day before the sheik's goatskin tent, fashioning a skirt of grasses for Gika, the Sheik appeared suddenly approaching. Instantly the look of happiness faded from the child's face. She shrunk aside in an attempt to scramble from the path of the leathern-faced old Arab, but she was not quick enough. With a brutal kick the man sent her sprawling upon her face, where she lay quite still, tearless but trembling. Then, with an oath at her, the man passed into the tent. The old, 
Blackhead shook with appreciative laughter, disclosing an occasional and lonesome yellow fang. When she was sure the shek had gone, the little girl crawled to the shady side of the tent, where she lay quite still, hugging Geeka close to her breast, her little form racked at long intervals with choking sobs. She dared not cry aloud, since that would have brought the shek upon her again. The anguish in her little heart was not alone the anguish of physical pain, but that infinitely more pathetic anguish of love denied a childish heart that yearns for love. Little Mariam could scarce recall any other existence than that of the stern cruelty of the Shek and Mabunu. Dimly, in the back of her childish memory there lurked a blurred recollection of a gentle mother, but Mariam was not sure but that even this was but a dream picture induced by her own desire for the caresses she never received, but which she lavished upon the much-loved Geeka. Never was such a spoiled child as Geeka. Its little mother, far from fashioning her own conduct after the example set her by her father and nurse, went to the extreme of indulgence. Geeka was kissed a thousand times a day. There was play in which Geeka was naughty, but the little mother never punished. Instead, she caressed and fondled, her attitude influenced solely by her own pathetic desire for love. Now, as she pressed Geeka close to her, her sobs lessened gradually, until she was able to control her voice, and pour out her misery into the ivory ear of her only confidant. Geeka loves Mariam, she whispered. Why does the Shek, my father, not love me, too? Am I so naughty? I try to be good, but I never know why he strikes me, so I cannot tell what I have done which displeases him. Just now he kicked me and hurt me so, Geeka, but I was only sitting before the tent making a skirt for you. That must be wicked, or he would not have kicked me for it. But why is it wicked, Geeka? Oh dear. I do not know, I do not know. I wish, Geeka, that I were dead. Yesterday the hunters brought in the body of Eladrea. Eladrea was quite dead. No more will he slink silently upon his unsuspecting prey. No more will his great head and his maimed shoulders strike terror to the hearts of the grass-eaters at the drinking fort by night. No more will his thundering roar shake the ground. Eladrea is dead. They beat his body terribly when it was brought into the village, but Eladrea did not mind. He did not feel the blows, for he was dead. When I am dead, Geeka, neither shall I feel the blows of Mabunu or the kicks of the Shek, my father. Then shall I be happy. Oh, Geeka, how I wish that I were dead! If Geeka contemplated a remonstrance it was cut short by sounds of altercation beyond the village gates. Mariam listened. With the curiosity of childhood she would have liked to have run down there and learn what it was that caused the men to talk so loudly. Others of the village were already trooping in the direction of the noise. But Mariam did not dare. The Shek would be there, doubtless, and if he saw her it would be but another opportunity to abuse her, so Mariam lay still and listened. Presently she heard the crowd moving up the street toward the Sheik's tent. Cautiously she stuck her little head around the edge of the tent. She could not resist the temptation, for the sameness of the village life was monotonous, and she craved diversion. What she saw was two strangers, white men. They were alone, but as they approached she learned from the talk of the natives that surrounded them that they possessed a considerable following that was camped outside the village. They were coming to palaver with the Shek. The old Arab met them at the entrance to his tent. His eyes narrowed wickedly when they had appraised the newcomers. They stopped before him, exchanging greetings. They had come to trade for ivory they said. The Shek grunted. He had no ivory. Mariam gasped. She knew that in a nearby hut the great tusks were piled almost to the roof. She poked her little head further forward to get a better view of the strangers. How white their skins! How yellow their great beards! Suddenly one of them turned his eyes in her direction. She tried to dodge back out of sight, for she feared all men, but he saw her. Mariam noticed the look of almost shocked surprise that crossed his face. The Shek saw it too, and guessed the cause of it. 
I have no ivory, he repeated. I do not wish to trade. Go away. Go now. He stepped from his tent and almost pushed the strangers about in the direction of the gates. They demurred, and then the sheikh threatened. It would have been suicide to have disobeyed, so the two men turned and left the village, making their way immediately to their own camp. The sheikh returned to his tent, but he did not enter it. Instead he walked to the side where little Miriam lay close to the goat skin wall, very frightened. The sheikh stooped and clutched her by the arm. Viciously he jerked her to her feet, dragged her to the entrance of the tent, and shoved her viciously within. Following her he again seized her, beating her ruthlessly. Stay within, he growled. Never let the strangers see thy face. Next time you show yourself to strangers I shall kill you. With a final vicious cuff he knocked the child into a far corner of the tent, where she lay stifling her moans, while the sheikh paced to and fro muttering to himself. At the entrance sat Mabunu, muttering and chuckling. In the camp of the strangers one was speaking rapidly to the other. There is no doubt of it, Malbin, he was saying. Not the slightest, but why the old scoundrel hasn't claimed the reward long since is what puzzles me. There are some things dearer to an Arab, Yen Sen, than money, returned the first speaker revenge is one of them. Anyhow it will not harm to try the power of gold, replied Yen Sen. Malbin shrugged. Not on the Sheikh, he said. We might try it on one of his people, but the Sheikh will not part with his revenge for gold. To offer it to him would only confirm his suspicions that we must have awakened when we were talking to him before his tent. If we got away with our lives, then, we should be fortunate. Well, try bribery, then, assented Yen Sen. But bribery failed, gruesomely. The tool they selected after a stay of several days in their camp outside the village was a tool, old headman of the sheikh's native contingent. He fell to the law of the shining metal, for he had lived upon the coast and knew the power of gold. He promised to bring them what they craved, late that night. Immediately after dark the two white men commenced to make arrangements to break camp. By midnight all was prepared. The porters lay beside their loads ready to swing them aloft at a moment's notice. The armed Askaris loitered between the balance of the safari and the Arab village, ready to form a rear guard for the retreat that was to begin the moment that the headman brought that which the white masters awaited. Presently there came the sound of footsteps along the path from the village. Instantly the Askaris and the whites were on the alert. More than a single man was approaching. Yen Sen stepped forward and challenged the newcomers in a low whisper. Who comes, he queried. Mbida, came the reply. Mbida was the name of the traitorous head man. Yen Sen was satisfied, though he wondered why Mbida had brought others with him. Presently he understood. The thing they fetched lay upon a litter borne by two men. Yen Sen cursed beneath his breath. Could the fool be bringing them a corpse? They had paid for a living prize. The bearers came to a halt before the white men. This has your gold purchased, said one of the two. They set the litter down, turned and vanished into the darkness toward the village. Malbin looked at Yen Sen, a crooked smile twisting his lips. The thing upon the litter was covered with a piece of cloth. Well, queried the latter. Raise the covering and see what you have bought. Much money shall we realize on a corpse especially after the six months beneath the burning sun that will be consumed in carrying it to its destination. The fool should have known that we desired her alive, grumbled Malbin, grasping a corner of the cloth and jerking the cover from the thing that lay upon the litter. At sight of what lay beneath both men stepped back involuntary oaths upon their lips, for there before them lay the dead body of Mbida the faithless head man. Five minutes later the safari of Yen Sen and Malbin was forcing its way rapidly toward the west, nervous Askaris guarding the rear from the attack they momentarily expected. Chapter 6 
His first night in the jungle was one which the son of Tarzan held longest in his memory. No savage carnivora menaced him. There was never a sign of hideous barbarian. Or, if there were, the boy's troubled mind took no cognizance of them. His conscience was harassed by the thought of his mother's suffering. Self-blame plunged him into the depths of misery. The killing of the American caused him little or no remorse. The fellow had earned his fate. Jack's regret on this score was due mainly to the effect which the death of Condon had had upon his own plans. Now he could not return directly to his parents as he had planned. Fear of the primitive, borderland law, of which he had read highly coloured, imaginary tales, had thrust him into the jungle a fugitive. He dared not return to the coast at this point not that he was so greatly influenced through personal fear as from a desire to shield his father and mother from further sorrow and from the shame of having their honoured name dragged through the sordid degradation of a murder trial. With returning day the boy's spirits rose. With the rising sun rose new hope within his breast. He would return to civilization by another way. None would guess that he had been connected with the killing of the stranger in the little out-of-the-way trading post upon a remote shore. Crouched close to the great ape in the crotch of a tree the boy had shivered through an almost sleepless night. His light pyjamas had been but little protection from the chill dampness of the jungle, and only that side of him which was pressed against the warm body of his shaggy companion approximated to comfort. And so he welcomed the rising sun with its promise of warmth as well as light, the blessed sun dispeller of physical and mental ills. He shook a cut into wakefulness. Come, he said. I am cold and hungry. We will search for food, out there in the sunlight, and he pointed to an open plain, dotted with stunted trees and strewn with jagged rock. The boy slid to the ground as he spoke, but the ape first looked carefully about, sniffing the morning air. Then, satisfied that no danger lurked near, he descended slowly to the ground beside the boy. Numa, and Sable his mate, feast upon those who descend first and look afterward, while those who look first and descend afterward live to feast themselves. Thus the old ape imparted to the son of Tarzan the boy's first lesson in jungle lore. Side by side they set off across the rough plain, for the boy wished first to be warm. The ape showed him the best places to dig for rodents and worms, but the lad only gagged at the thought of devouring the repulsive things. Some eggs they found, and these he sucked raw, as also he ate roots and tubers which are cut unearthed. Beyond the plain and across a low bluff they came upon water, brackish, ill-smelling stuff in a shallow water hole, the sides and bottom of which were trampled by the feet of many beasts. A herd of zebra galloped away as they approached. The lad was too thirsty by now to cavil at anything even remotely resembling water, so he drank his fill while Akut stood with raised head, alert for any danger. Before the ape drank he cautioned the boy to be watchful, but as he drank he raised his head from time to time to cast a quick glance toward a clump of bushes a hundred yards away upon the opposite side of the water hole. When he had done he rose and spoke to the boy, in the language that was their common heritage, the tongue of the great apes. There is no danger near, he asked. None, replied the boy. I saw nothing move while you drank. Your eyes will help you but little in the jungle, said the ape. Here, if you would live, you must depend upon your ears and your nose but most upon your nose. When we came down to drink I knew that no danger lurked near upon this side of the water hole, for else the zebras would have discovered it and fled before we came but upon the other side toward which the wind blows danger might lie concealed. We could not smell it for its scent is being blown in the other direction, and so I bent my ears and eyes downwind where my nose cannot travel. And you found nothing? asked the lad, with a laugh. I found Numa crouching in that clump of bushes where the tall grasses grow, and Akut pointed. A lion, exclaimed the boy. How do you know? I can see nothing. Numa is there, though, replied the great ape. First I heard him sigh. To you the sigh of Numa may sound no different from the other noises which the wind makes among the grasses and the trees, 
but later you must learn to know the sigh of Numa. Then I watched and at last I saw the tall grasses moving at one point to a force other than the force of the wind. See, they are spread there upon either side of Numa's great body, and as he breathes, you see. You see the little motion at either side that is not caused by the wind the motion that none of the other grasses have. The boy strained his eyes, better eyes than the ordinary boy inherits, and at last he gave a little exclamation of discovery. Yes, he said, I see. He lies there, and he pointed. His head is toward us. Is he watching us? Numa is watching us, replied Akut, but we are in little danger, unless we approach too close, for he is lying upon his kill. His belly is almost full, or we should hear him crunching the bones. He is watching us in silence merely from curiosity. Presently he will resume his feeding or he will rise and come down to the water for a drink. As he neither fears or desires us he will not try to hide his presence from us, but now is an excellent time to learn to know Numa, for you must learn to know him well if you would live long in the jungle. Where the great apes are many Numa leaves us alone. Our fangs are long and strong, and we can fight, but when we are alone and he is hungry we are no match for him. Come, we will circle him and catch his scent. The sooner you learn to know it the better, but keep close to the trees, as we go around him, for Numa often does that which he is least expected to do. And keep your ears and your eyes and your nose open. Remember always that there may be an enemy behind every bush, in every tree and amongst every clump of jungle grass. While you are avoiding Numa do not run into the jaws of Sable, his mate. Follow me and Akut set off in a wide circle about the water hole and the crouching lion. The boy followed close upon his heels, his every sense upon the alert, his nerves keyed to the highest pitch of excitement. This was life. For the instant he forgot his resolutions of a few minutes past to hasten to the coast at some other point than that at which he had landed and make his way immediately back to London. He thought now only of the savage joy of living and of pitting one's wits and prowess against the wiles and might of the savage jungle brood which haunted the broad plains and the gloomy forest isles of the great, untamed continent. He knew no fear. His father had had none to transmit to him, but honour and conscience he did have and these were to trouble him many times as they battled with his inherent love of freedom for possession of his soul. They had passed but a short distance to the rear of Numa when the boy caught the unpleasant odour of the carnivore. His face lighted with a smile. Something told him that he would have known that scent among a myriad of others even if Akut had not told him that a lion lay near. There was a strange familiarity, a weird familiarity in it that made the short hairs rise at the nape of his neck, and brought his upper lip into an involuntary snarl that bared his fighting fangs. There was a sense of stretching of the skin about his ears for all the world as though those members were flattening back against his skull in preparation for deadly combat. His skin tingled. He was aglow with a pleasurable sensation that he never before had known. He was, upon the instant, another creature, wary, alert, ready. Thus did the scent of Numa, the lion, transform the boy into a beast. He had never seen a lion, his mother had gone to great pains to prevent it. But he had devoured countless pictures of them, and now he was ravenous to feast his eyes upon the king of beasts in the flesh. As he trailed Akut he kept an eye cocked over one shoulder, rearward, in the hope that Numa might rise from his kill and reveal himself. Thus it happened that he dropped some little way behind Akut, and the next he knew he was recalled suddenly to a contemplation of other matters than the hidden Numa by a shrill scream of warning from the ape. Turning his eyes quickly in the direction of his companion, the boy saw that, standing in the path directly before him, which sent tremors of excitement racing along every nerve of his body. With body half merging from a clump of bushes in which she must have lain hidden stood a sleek and beautiful lioness. Her yellow-green eyes were round and staring, boring straight into the eyes of the boy. Not ten paces separated them. Twenty paces behind the lioness stood the great ape, bellowing instructions to the boy and hurling taunts at the lioness in an evident effort to attract her attention from the lad while he gained the shelter of a nearby tree. 
but Sabor was not to be diverted. She had her eyes upon the lad. He stood between her and her mate, between her and the kill. It was suspicious. Probably he had ulterior designs upon her lord and master or upon the fruits of their hunting. A lioness is short-tempered. Akut's bellowing annoyed her. She uttered a little rumbling growl, taking a step toward the boy. The tree, screamed Akut. The boy turned and fled, and at the same instant the lioness charged. The tree was but a few paces away. A limb hung ten feet from the ground, and as the boy leaped for it the lioness leaped for him. Like a monkey he pulled himself up and to one side. A great forepaw caught him a glancing blow at the hips, just grazing him. One curved talon hooked itself into the waistband of his pyjama trousers, ripping them from him as the lioness sped by. Half-naked the lad drew himself to safety as the beast turned and leaped for him once more. Akut, from a nearby tree, jabbered and scolded, calling the lioness all manner of foul names. The boy, patterning his conduct after that of his preceptor, unstop at the vials of his invective upon the head of the enemy, until in realization of the futility of words as weapons he bethought himself of something heavier to hurl. There was nothing but dead twigs and branches at hand, but these he flung at the upturned, snarling face of Sable just as his father had before him twenty years ago, when as a boy he too had taunted and tantalized the great cats of the jungle. The lioness fretted about the bowl of the tree for a short time but finally, either realizing the uselessness of her vigil, or prompted by the pangs of hunger, she stalked majestically away and disappeared in the brush that hid her lord, who had not once shown himself during the altercation. Freed from their retreats Akut and the boy came to the ground, to take up their interrupted journey once more. The old ape scolded the lad for his carelessness. Had you not been so intent upon the lion behind you you might have discovered the lioness much sooner than you did. But you passed right by her without seeing her, retorted the boy. Akut was chagrined. It is thus, he said, that jungle folk die. We go cautiously for a lifetime, and then, just for an instant, we forget, and he ground his teeth in mimicry of the crunching of great jaws in flesh. It is a lesson, he resumed. You have learned that you may not for too long keep your eyes and your ears and your nose all bent in the same direction. That night the son of Tarzan was colder than he ever had been in all his life. The pyjama trousers had not been heavy, but they had been much heavier than nothing. And the next day he roasted in the hot sun, for again their way led much across wide and treeless plains. It was still in the boy's mind to travel to the south, and circle back to the coast in search of another outpost of civilization. He had said nothing of this plan to Akut for he knew that the old ape would look with displeasure upon any suggestion that savoured of separation. For a month the two wandered on, the boy learning rapidly the laws of the jungle, his muscles adapting themselves to the new mode of life that had been thrust upon them. The fuse of the sire had been transmitted to the sun, it needed only the hardening of use to develop them. The lad found that it came quite naturally to him to swing through the trees. Even at great heights he never felt the slightest dizziness, and when he had caught the knack of the swing and the release, he could hurl himself through space from branch to branch with even greater agility than the heavier Akut. And with exposure came a toughening and hardening of his smooth, white skin, browning now beneath the sun and wind. He had removed his pyjama jacket one day to bathe in a little stream that was too small to harbour crocodiles and while he and Akut had been disporting themselves in the cool waters a monkey had dropped down from the overhanging trees, snatched up the boy's single remaining article of civilized garmenture, and scampered away with it. For a time Jack was angry, but when he had been without the jacket for a short while he began to realize that being half-clothed is infinitely more uncomfortable than being entirely naked. Soon he did not miss his clothing in the least, and from that he came to revel in the freedom of his unhampered state. Occasionally a smile would cross his face as he tried to imagine the surprise of his schoolmates could they but see him now. They would envy him. Yes, how they would envy him. He felt sorry for them at such times, and again, as he thought of them amid luxuries and comforts of their English homes, happy with their fathers and mothers, 
a most uncomfortable lump would arise into the boy's throat, and he would see a vision of his mother's face through a blur of mist that came unbidden to his eyes. Then it was that he urged a cut onward, for now they were headed westward toward the coast. The old ape thought that they were searching for a tribe of his own kind, nor did the boy disabuse his mind of this belief. It would do to tell Akut of his real plans when they had come within sight of civilization. One day as they were moving slowly along beside a river they came unexpectedly upon a native village. Some children were playing beside the water. The boy's heart leaped within his breast at sight of them, for over a month he had seen no human being. What if these were naked savages? What if their skins were black? Were they not creatures fashioned in the mold of their maker, as was he? They were his brothers and sisters. He started toward them. With a low warning Akut laid a hand upon his arm to hold him back. The boy shook himself free, and with a shout of greeting ran forward toward the ebon players. The sound of his voice brought every head erect. Wide eyes viewed him for an instant, and then, with screams of terror, the children turned and fled toward the village. At their heels ran their mothers, and from the village gate, in response to the alarm, came a score of warriors, hastily snatched spears and shields ready in their hands. At sight of the consternation he had wrought the boy halted. The glad smile faded from his face as with wild shouts and menacing gestures the warriors ran toward him. Akut was calling to him from behind to turn and flee, telling him that the blacks would kill him. For a moment he stood watching them coming, then he raised his hand with the palm toward them in signal for them to halt, calling out at the same time that he came as a friend that he had only wanted to play with their children. Of course they did not understand a word that he addressed to them, and their answer was what any naked creature who had run suddenly out of the jungle upon their women and children might have expected a shower of spears. The missiles struck all about the boy, but none touched him. Again his spine tingled and the short hairs lifted at the nape of his neck and along the top of his scalp. His eyes narrowed. Sudden hatred flared in them to wither the expression of glad friendliness that had lighted them but an instant before. With a low snarl, quite similar to that of a baffled beast, he turned and ran into the jungle. There was Akut awaiting him in a tree. The ape urged him to hasten in flight, for the wise old anthropoid knew that they too, naked and unarmed, were no match for the sinewy black warriors who would doubtless make some sort of search for them through the jungle. But a new power moved the son of Tarzan. He had come with a boy's glad and open heart to offer his friendship to these people who were human beings like himself. He had been met with suspicion and spears. They had not even listened to him. Rage and hatred consumed him. When Akat urged speed he held back. He wanted to fight, yet his reason made it all too plain that it would be but a foolish sacrifice of his life to meet these armed men with his naked hands and his teeth. Already the boy thought of his teeth, of his fighting fangs, when possibility of combat loomed close. Moving slowly through the trees he kept his eyes over his shoulder, Though he no longer neglected the possibilities of other dangers which might lurk on either hand or ahead, his experience with the lioness did not need a repetition to ensure the permanency of the lesson it had taught. Behind he could hear the savages advancing with shouts and cries. He lagged further behind until the pursuers were in sight. They did not see him, for they were not looking among the branches of the trees for human quarry. The lad kept just ahead of them. For a mile perhaps they continued the search and then they turned back toward the village. Here was the boy's opportunity, that for which he had been waiting, while the hot blood of revenge coursed through his veins until he saw his pursuers through a scarlet haze. When they turned back he turned and followed them. Akut was no longer in sight. Thinking that the boy followed he had gone on further ahead. He had no wish to tempt fate within range of those deadly spears. Slinking silently from tree to tree the boy dogged the footsteps of the returning warriors. At last one dropped behind his fellows as they followed a narrow path toward the village. A grim smile lit the lad's face. Swiftly he hurried forward until he moved almost above the unconscious black stalking him as Shieta, the panther, stalked his prey, as the boy had seen Shieta do on many occasions. 
suddenly and silently he leaped forward and downward upon the broad shoulders of his prey. In the instant of contact his fingers sought and found the man's throat. The weight of the boy's body hurled the black heavily to the ground, the knees in his back knocking the breath from him as he struck. Then a set of strong, white teeth fastened themselves in his neck, and muscular fingers closed tighter upon his windpipe. For a time the warrior struggled frantically, throwing himself about in an effort to dislodge his antagonist, but all the while he was weakening and all the while the grim and silent thing he could not see clung tenaciously to him, and dragged him slowly into the bush to one side of the trail. Hidden there at last, safe from the prying eyes of searchers, should they miss their fellow and return for him, the lad choked the life from the body of his victim. At last he knew by the sudden struggle, followed by limp relaxation, that the warrior was dead. Then a strange desire seized him. His whole being quivered and thrilled. Involuntarily he leaped to his feet and placed one foot upon the body of his kill. His chest expanded. He raised his face toward the heavens and opened his mouth to voice a strange, weird cry that seemed screaming within him for outward expression, but no sound passed his lips, he just stood there for a full minute, his face turned toward the sky, his breast heaving to the pent emotion, like an animate statue of vengeance. The silence which marked the first great kill of the son of Tarzan was to typify all his future kills, just as the hideous victory cry of the bull ape had marked the kills of his mighty sire. Chapter 7 Akut, discovering that the boy was not close behind him, turned back to search for him. He had gone but a short distance in return when he was brought to a sudden and startled halt by sight of a strange figure moving through the trees toward him. It was the boy, yet could it be? In his hand was a long spear, down his back hung an oblong shield such as the black warriors who had attacked them had worn, and upon ankle and arm were bands of iron and brass, while a loincloth was twisted about the youth's middle. A knife was thrust through its folds. When the boy saw the ape he hastened forward to exhibit his trophies. Proudly he called attention to each of his newly won possessions. Boastfully he recounted the details of his exploit. With my bare hands and my teeth I killed him, he said. I would have made friends with them but they chose to be my enemies. And now that I have a spear I shall show Numa, too, what it means to have me for a foe. Only the white men and the great apes, Akut, are our friends. Then we shall seek, all others must we avoid or kill. This have I learned of the jungle. They made a detour about the hostile village, and resumed their journey toward the coast. The boy took much pride in his new weapons and ornaments. He practiced continually with the spear, throwing it at some object ahead our by our as they traveled their loitering way until he gained a proficiency such as only youthful muscles may attain to speedily. All the while his training went on under the guidance of Akut. No longer was there a single jungle spore but was an open book to the keen eyes of the lad, and those other indefinite spore that elude the senses of civilized man and are only partially appreciable to his savage cousin came to be familiar friends of the eager boy. He could differentiate the innumerable species of the herbivora by scent, and he could tell, too, whether an animal was approaching or departing merely by the waxing or waning strength of its effluvium. Nor did he need the evidence of his eyes to tell him whether there were two lions or four upwind, a hundred yards away or half a mile. Much of this had Akut taught him, but far more was instinctive knowledge a species of strange intuition inherited from his father. He had come to love the jungle life. The constant battle of wits and senses against the many deadly foes that lurked by day and by night along the pathway of the wary and the unwary appealed to the spirit of adventure which breathes strong in the heart of every red-blooded son of primordial Adam. Yet, though he loved it, he had not let his selfish desires outweigh the sense of duty that had brought him to a realization of the moral wrong which lay beneath the adventurous escapade that had brought him to Africa. His love of father and mother was strong within him too strong to permit unalloyed happiness which was undoubtedly causing them days of sorrow. And so he held tight to his determination to find a port upon the coast where he might communicate with them and receive funds for his return to London. 
There he felt sure that he could now persuade his parents to let him spend at least a portion of his time upon those African estates which from little careless remarks dropped at home he knew his father possessed. That would be something, better at least than a lifetime of the cramped and cloying restrictions of civilization. And so he was rather contented than otherwise as he made his way in the direction of the coast, for while he enjoyed the liberty and the savage pleasures of the world his conscience was at the same time clear, for he knew that he was doing all that lay in his power to return to his parents. He rather looked forward, too, to meeting white men again, creatures of his own kind, for there had been many occasions upon which he had longed for other companionship than that of the old ape. The affair with the blacks still rankled in his heart. He had approached them in such innocent good fellowship and with such childlike assurance of a hospitable welcome that the reception which had been accorded him had proved a shock to his boyish ideals. He no longer looked upon the black man as his brother, but rather as only another of the innumerable foes of the bloodthirsty jungle a beast of prey which walked upon two feet instead of four. But if the blacks were his enemies there were those in the world who were not. There were those who always would welcome him with open arms, who would accept him as a friend and brother, and with whom he might find sanctuary from every enemy. Yes, there were always white men. Somewhere along the coast or even in the depths of the jungle itself there were white men. To them he would be a welcome visitor. They would befriend him. And there were also the great apes, the friends of his father and of Akut. How glad they would be to receive the son of Tarzan of the apes. He hoped that he could come upon them before he found a trading post upon the coast. He wanted to be able to tell his father that he had known his old friends of the jungle, that he had hunted with them, that he had joined with them in their savage life, and their fierce, primeval ceremonies, the strange ceremonies of which Akut had tried to tell him. It cheered him immensely to dwell upon these happy meetings. Often he rehearsed the long speech which he would make to the apes in which he would tell them of the life of their former king since he had left them. At other times he would play at meeting with white men. Then he would enjoy their consternation at sight of a naked white boy trapped in the war togs of a black warrior and roaming the jungle with only a great ape as his companion. And so the days passed, and with the travelling and the hunting and the climbing the boy's muscles developed and his agility increased until even phlegmatic Akut marvelled at the prowess of his pupil. And the boy, realizing his great strength and reveling in it, became careless. He strode through the jungle, his proud head erect, defying danger. Where Akut took to the trees at the first scent of Numa, the lad laughed in the face of the king of beasts and walked boldly past him. Good fortune was with him for a long time. The lions he met were well fed, perhaps, or the very boldness of the strange creature which invaded their domain so filled them with surprise that thoughts of attack were banished from their minds as they stood, round-eyed, watching his approach and his departure. Whatever the cause, however, the fact remains that on many occasions the boy passed within a few paces of some great lion without arousing more than a warning growl. But no two lions are necessarily alike in character or temper. They differ as greatly as do individuals of the human family. Because ten lions act similarly under similar conditions one cannot say that the eleventh lion will do likewise, the chances are that he will not. The lion is a creature of high nervous development. He thinks, therefore he reasons. Having a nervous system and brains he is the possessor of temperament, which is affected variously by extraneous causes. One day the boy met the eleventh lion. The former was walking across a small plain upon which grew little clumps of bushes. Akut was a few yards to the left of the lad who was the first to discover the presence of Numa. Run, Akut, called the boy, laughing. Numa lies hid in the bushes to my right. Take to the trees. Akut. I, the son of Tarzan, will protect you, and the boy, laughing, kept straight along his way which led close beside the brush in which Numa lay concealed. The ape shouted to him to come away, but the lad only flourished his spear and executed an improvised war dance to show his contempt for the king of beasts. Closer and closer to the dread destroyer he came, until, with a sudden, angry growl, the lion rose from his bed not ten paces from the youth. A huge fellow he was, this lord of the jungle and the desert. 
A shaggy manette clothed his shoulders. Cruel fangs armed his great jaws. His yellow-green eyes blazed with hatred and challenge. The boy, with his pitifully inadequate spear ready in his hand, realized quickly that this lion was different from the others he had met, but he had gone too far now to retreat. The nearest tree lay several yards to his left, the lion could be upon him before he had covered half the distance, and that the beast intended to charge none could doubt who looked upon him now. Beyond the lion was a thorn tree only a few feet beyond him. It was the nearest sanctuary but Numa stood between it and his prey. The feel of the long spear shaft in his hand and the sight of the tree beyond the lion gave the lad an idea, a preposterous idea, a ridiculous, forlorn hope of an idea, but there was no time now to weigh chances, there was but a single chance, and that was the thorn tree. If the lion charged it would be too late, the lad must charge first, and to the astonishment of Akut and none the less of Numa, the boy leaped swiftly toward the beast. Just for a second was the lion motionless with surprise and in that second Jack Clayton put to the crucial test an accomplishment which he had practiced at school. Straight for the savage brute he ran, his spear held but foremost across his body. Akut shrieked in terror and amazement. The lion stood with wide, round eyes awaiting the attack, ready to rear upon his hind feet and receive this rash creature with blows that could crush the skull of a buffalo. Just in front of the lion the boy placed the butt of his spear upon the ground, gave a mighty spring, and, before the bewildered beast could guess the trick that had been played upon him, sailed over the lion's head into the rending embrace of the thorn tree, safe but lacerated. Akut had never before seen a pole vault. Now he leaped up and down within the safety of his own tree, screaming taunts and boasts at the discomfited Numa, while the boy, torn and bleeding, sought some position in his thorny retreat in which he might find the least agony. He had saved his life, but at considerable cost in suffering. It seemed to him that the lion would never leave, and it was a full hour before the angry brute gave up his vigil and strode majestically away across the plain. When he was at a safe distance the boy extricated himself from the thorn tree, but not without inflicting new wounds upon his already tortured flesh. It was many days before the outward evidence of the lesson he had learned had left him, while the impression upon his mind was one that was to remain with him for life. Never again did he uselessly tempt fate. He took long chances often in his afterlife, but only when the taking of chances might further the attainment of some cherished end and, always thereafter, he practiced pole vaulting. For several days the boy and the ape lay up while the former recovered from the painful wounds inflicted by the sharp thorns. The great anthropoid licked the wounds of his human friend, nor, aside from this, did they receive other treatment, but they soon healed, for healthy flesh quickly replaces itself. When the lad felt fit again the two continued their journey toward the coast, and once more the boy's mind was filled with pleasurable anticipation. And at last the much-dreamed-of moment came. They were passing through a tangled forest when the boy's sharp eyes discovered from the lower branches through which he was travelling an old but well-marked spore, a spore that set his heart to leaping, the spore of man, of white men, for among the prints of naked feet were the well-defined outlines of European-made boots. The trail, which marked the passage of a good-sized company, pointed north at right angles to the course the boy and the ape were taking toward the coast. Doubtless these white men knew the nearest coast settlement. They might even be headed for it now. At any rate it would be worth while overtaking them if even only for the pleasure of meeting again creatures of his own kind. The lad was all excitement, palpitant with eagerness to be off in pursuit. Akut demurred. He wanted nothing of men. To him the lad was a fellow ape, for he was the son of the king of apes. He tried to dissuade the boy telling him that soon they should come upon a tribe of their own folk where some day when he was older the boy should be king as his father had before him. But Jack was obdurate. He insisted that he wanted to see white men again. He wanted to send a message to his parents. Akut listened and as he listened the intuition of the beast suggested the truth to him, the boy was planning to return to his own kind. The thought filled the old ape with sorrow. He loved the boy as he had loved the father, with the loyalty and faithfulness of a hound for its master. 
In his ape brain and his ape heart he had nursed the hope that he and the lad would never be separated. He saw all his fondly cherished plans fading away, and yet he remained loyal to the lad and to his wishes. Though disconsolate he gave in to the boy's determination to pursue the safari of the white men, accompanying him upon what he believed would be their last journey together. The spore was but a couple of days old when the two discovered it, which meant that the slow-moving caravan was but a few hours distant from them whose trained and agile muscles could carry their bodies swiftly through the branches above the tangled undergrowth which had impeded the progress of the laden carriers of the white men. The boy was in the lead, excitement and anticipation carrying him ahead of his companion to whom the attainment of their goal meant only sorrow. And it was the boy who first saw the rear guard of the caravan and the white men he had been so anxious to overtake. Stumbling along the tangled trail of those ahead a dozen heavily laden blacks who, from fatigue or sickness, had dropped behind were being prodded by the black soldiers of the rear guard, kicked when they fell, and then roughly jerked to their feet and hustled onward. On either side walked a giant white man, heavy blonde beards almost obliterating their countenances. The boy's lips formed a glad cry of salutation as his eyes first discovered the whites a cry that was never uttered, for almost immediately he witnessed that which turned his happiness to anger as he saw that both the white men were wielding heavy whips brutally upon the naked backs of the poor devils staggering along beneath loads that would have overtaxed the strength and endurance of strong men at the beginning of a new day. Every now and then the rear guard and the white men cast apprehensive glances rearward as though momentarily expecting the materialization of some long-expected danger from that quarter. The boy had paused after his first sight of the caravan, and now was following slowly in the wake of the sordid, brutal spectacle. Presently Akut came up with him. To the beast there was less of horror in the sight than to the lad, yet even the great ape growled beneath his breath at useless torture being inflicted upon the helpless slaves. He looked at the boy. Now that he had caught up with the creatures of his own kind, why was it that he did not rush forward and greet them? He put the question to his companion. They are fiends, muttered the boy. I would not travel with such as they, for if I did I should set upon them and kill them the first time they beat their people as they are beating them now, but, he added, after a moment's thought, I can ask them the whereabouts of the nearest port, and then, Akut, we can leave them. The ape made no reply, and the boy swung to the ground and started at a brisk walk toward the safari. He was a hundred yards away, perhaps, when one of the whites caught sight of him. The man gave a shout of alarm, instantly leveling his rifle upon the boy and firing. The bullet struck just in front of its mark, scattering turf and fallen leaves against the lad's legs. A second later the other white and the black soldiers of the rear guard were firing hysterically at the boy. Jack leaped behind a tree, unhit. Days of panic-ridden flight through the jungle had filled Carl Yensen and Sven Malbin with jangling nerves and their native boys with unreasoning terror. Every new note from behind sounded to their frightened ears the coming of the Sheik and his bloodthirsty entourage. They were in a blue funk, and the sight of the naked white warrior stepping silently out of the jungle through which they had just passed had been sufficient shock to let loose in action all the pent nerve energy of Malbin who had been the first to see the strange apparition. And Malbin's shout and shot had set the others going. When their nervous energy had spent itself and they came to take stock of what they had been fighting it developed that Malbin alone had seen anything clearly. Several of the blacks averred that they too had obtained a good view of the creature but their descriptions of it varied so greatly that Yin Sen, who had seen nothing himself, was inclined to be a trifle sceptical. One of the blacks insisted that the thing had been eleven feet tall, with a man's body and the head of an elephant. Another had seen three immense Arabs with huge, black beards, but when, after conquering their nervousness, the rear guard advanced upon the enemy's position to investigate they found nothing, for Akut and the boy had retreated out of range of the unfriendly guns. Jack was disheartened and sad. He had not entirely recovered from the depressing effect of the unfriendly reception he had received at the hands of the blacks, and now he had found an even more hostile one accorded him by men of his own color. The lesser beasts flee from me in terror, he murmured, half to himself, the greater beasts are ready to tear me to pieces at sight. 
black men would kill me with their spears or arrows. And now white men, men of my own kind, have fired upon me and driven me away. Are all the creatures of the world my enemies? Has the son of Tarzan no friend other than Akut? The old ape drew closer to the boy. There are the great apes, he said. They only will be the friends of Akut's friend. Only the great apes will welcome the son of Tarzan. You have seen that men want nothing of you. Let us go now and continue our search for the great apes, our people. The language of the great apes is a combination of monosyllabic gutturals, amplified by gestures and signs. It may not be literally translated into human speech, but as near as may be this is what Akut said to the boy. The two proceeded in silence for some time after Akut had spoken. The boy was immersed in deep thought, bitter thoughts in which hatred and revenge predominated. Finally he spoke, very well, Akut, he said, we will find our friends, the great apes. The anthropoid was overjoyed, but he gave no outward demonstration of his pleasure. A low grunt was his only response, and a moment later he had leaped nimbly upon a small and unwary rodent that had been surprised at a fatal distance from its burrow. Tearing the unhappy creature in two Akut handed the lion's share to the lad. Chapter 8 a year had passed since the two Swedes had been driven in terror from the savage country where the Sheik held sway. Little Miriam still played with Geeka, lavishing all her childish love upon the now almost hopeless ruin of what had never, even in its palmiest days, possessed even a slight degree of loveliness. But to Miriam, Geeka was all that was sweet and adorable. She carried to the deaf ears of the battered ivory head all her sorrows, all her hopes, and all her ambitions. For even in the face of hopelessness, in the clutches of the dread authority from which there was no escape, little Miriam yet cherished hopes and ambitions. It is true that her ambitions were rather nebulous in form, consisting chiefly of a desire to escape with Geeka to some remote and unknown spot where there were no sheiks, no mabunas, where El Adrea could find no entrance, and where she might play all day surrounded only by flowers and birds and the harmless little monkeys playing in the treetops. The Sheik had been away for a long time, conducting a caravan of ivory, skins, and rubber far into the north. The interim had been one of great peace for Miriam. It is true that Mabunu had still been with her, to pinch or beat her as the mood seized the villainous old hag, but Mabunu was only one. When the Sheik was there also there were two of them, and the Sheik was stronger and more brutal even than Mabunu. Little Miriam often wondered why the grim old man hated her so. It is true that he was cruel and unjust to all with whom he came in contact, but to Miriam he reserved his greatest cruelties, his most studied injustices. Today Miriam was squatting at the foot of a large tree which grew inside the palisade close to the edge of the village. She was fashioning a tent of leaves for Geeka. Before the tent were some pieces of wood and small leaves and a few stones. These were the household utensils. Geeka was cooking dinner. As the little girl played she prattled continuously to her companion, propped in a sitting position with a couple of twigs. She was totally absorbed in the domestic duties of Geeka, so much so that she did not note the gentle swaying of the branches of the tree above her as they bent to the body of the creature that had entered them stealthily from the jungle. In happy ignorance the little girl played on, while from above two steady eyes looked down upon her unblinking, unwavering. There was none other than the little girl in this part of the village, which had been almost deserted since the Sheik had left long months before upon his journey toward the north. And out in the jungle, an hour's march from the village, the Sheik was leading his returning caravan homeward. A year had passed since the white men had fired upon the lad and driven him back into the jungle to take up his search for the only remaining creatures to whom he might look for companionship, the great apes. For months the two had wandered eastward, deeper and deeper into the jungle. The year had done much for the boy, turning his already mighty muscles to thews of steel, developing his woodcraft to a point where it verged upon the uncanny, perfecting his arboreal instincts, and training him in the use of both natural and artificial weapons. He had become at last a creature of marvellous physical powers and mental cunning. 
He was still but a boy, yet so great was his strength that the powerful anthropoid with which he often engaged in mimic battle was no match for him. Akut had taught him to fight as the bull ape fights, nor ever was there a teacher better fitted to instruct in the savage warfare of primordial man, or a pupil better equipped to profit by the lessons of a master. As the two searched for a band of the almost extinct species of ape to which Akut belonged they lived upon the best the jungle afforded. Antelope and zebra fell to the boy's spear, or were dragged down by the two powerful beasts of prey who leaped upon them from some overhanging limb or from the ambush of the undergrowth beside the trail to the water hole or the ford. The pelt of a leopard covered the nakedness of the youth, but the wearing of it had not been dictated by any prompting of modesty. With the rifle shots of the white men showering about him he had reverted to the savagery of the beast that is inherent in each of us, but that flamed more strongly in this boy whose father had been raised a beast of prey. He wore his leopard skin at first in response to a desire to parade a trophy of his prowess, for he had slain the leopard with his knife in a hand-to-hand -hand combat. He saw that the skin was beautiful, which appealed to his barbaric sense of ornamentation, and when it stiffened and later commenced to decompose because of his having no knowledge of how to cure or turn it was with sorrow and regret that he discarded it. Later, when he chanced upon a lone, black warrior wearing the counterpart of it, soft and clinging and beautiful from proper curing, it required but an instant to leap from above upon the shoulders of the unsuspecting black, sink a keen blade into his heart and possess the rightly preserved hide. There were no afterqualms of conscience. In the jungle might is right, nor does it take long to inculcate this axiom in the mind of a jungle dweller, regardless of what his past training may have been. That the black would have killed him had he had the chance the boy knew full well. Neither he nor the black were any more sacred than the lion, or the buffalo, the zebra, or the deer, or any other of the countless creatures who roamed, or slunk, or flew, or wriggled through the dark mazes of the forest. Each had but a single life, which was sought by many. The greater number of enemies slain the better chance to prolong that life. So the boy smiled and donned the finery of the vanquished, and went his way with Akut, searching, always searching for the elusive anthropoids who were to welcome them with open arms. And at last they found them. Deep in the jungle, buried far from sight of man, they came upon such another little natural arena as had witnessed the wild ceremony of the dum-dum in which the boy's father had taken part long years before. First, at a great distance, they heard the beating of the drum of the great apes. They were sleeping in the safety of a huge tree when the booming sound smote upon their ears. Both awoke at once. Akut was the first to interpret the strange cadence. The great apes, he growled. They danced the dum-dum. Come, Korak, son of Tarzan, let us go to our people. Months before Akut had given the boy a name of his own choosing, since he could not master the man-given name of Jack. Korak is as near as it may be interpreted into human speech. In the language of the apes it means killer. Now the killer rose upon the branch of the great tree where he had been sleeping with his back braced against the stem. He stretched his lithe young muscles, the moonlight filtering through the foliage from above dappling his brown skin with little patches of light. The ape, too, stood up, half squatting after the manner of his kind. Low growls rumbled from the bottom of his deep chest, growls of excited anticipation. The boy growled in harmony with the ape. Then the anthropoid slid softly to the ground. Close by, in the direction of the booming drum, lay a clearing which they must cross. The moon flooded it with silvery light. Half erect, the great ape shuffled into the full glare of the moon. At his side, swinging gracefully along in marked contrast to the awkwardness of his companion, strode the boy, the dark, shaggy coat of the one brushing against the smooth, clear hide of the other. The lad was humming now, a music hall air that had found its way to the forms of the great English public school that was to see him no more. He was happy and expectant. The moment he had looked forward to for so long was about to be realized. He was coming into his own. He was coming home. As the months had dragged or flown along, retarded or spurred on as privation or adventure predominated, 
thoughts of his own home, while oft recurring, had become less vivid. The old life had grown to seem more like a dream than a reality, and the balking of his determination to reach the coast and return to London had finally thrown the hope of realisation so remotely into the future that it too now seemed little more than a pleasant but hopeless dream. Now all thoughts of London and civilization were crowded so far into the background of his brain that they might as well have been non-existent. Except for form and mental development he was as much an ape as the great, fierce creature at his side. In the exuberance of his joy he slapped his companion roughly on the side of the head. Half in anger, half in play the anthropoid turned upon him, his fangs bared and glistening. Long, hairy arms reached out to seize him and, as they had done a thousand times before, the two clinched in mimic battle, rolling upon the sword, striking, growling and biting, though never closing their teeth in more than a rough pinch. It was wondrous practice for them both. The boy brought into play wrestling tricks that he had learned at school, and many of these Akut learned to use and to foil. And from the ape the boy learned the methods that had been handed down to Akut from some common ancestor of them both who had roamed the teeming earth when ferns were trees and crocodiles were birds. But there was one art the boy possessed which Akut could not master, though he did achieve fair proficiency in it for an ape, boxing. To have his ball-like charges stopped and crumpled with a suddenly planted fist upon the end of his snout, or a painful jolt in the short ribs, always surprised Akut. It angered him too and at such times his mighty jaws came nearer to closing in the soft flesh of his friend than at any other, for he was still an ape, with an ape's short temper and brutal instincts, but the difficulty was in catching his tormentor while his rage lasted, for when he lost his head and rushed madly into close quarters with the boy he discovered that the stinging hail of blows released upon him always found their mark and effectually stopped him effectually and painfully. Then he would withdraw growling viciously, backing away with grinning jaws distended, to sulk for an hour or so. Tonight they did not box. Just for a moment or two they wrestled playfully, until the scent of Shieta, the panther, brought them to their feet, alert and wary. The great cat was passing through the jungle in front of them. For a moment it paused, listening. The boy and the ape growled menacingly in chorus and the carnival moved on. Then the two took up their journey toward the sound of the dum-dum. Louder and louder came the beating of the drum. Now, at last, they could hear the growling of the dancing apes, and strong to their nostrils came the scent of their kind. The lad trembled with excitement. The hair down Akut's spine stiffened, the symptoms of happiness and anger are often similar. Silently they crept through the jungle as they neared the meeting place of the apes. Now they were in the trees worming their way forward, alert for sentinels. Presently through a break in the foliage the scene burst upon the eager eyes of the boy. To Akut it was a familiar one, but to Korak it was all new. His nerves tingled at the savage sight. The great bulls were dancing in the moonlight, leaping in an irregular circle about the flat-topped earthen drum about which three old females sat beating its resounding top with sticks worn smooth by long years of use. Akut, knowing the temper and customs of his kind, was too wise to make their presence known until the frenzy of the dance had passed. After the drum was quiet and the bellies of the tribe well filled he would hail them. Then would come a parley, after which he and Korak would be accepted into membership by the community. There might be those who would object, but such could be overcome by brute force, of which he and the lad had an ample surplus. For weeks, possibly months, their presence might cause ever-decreasing suspicion among others of the tribe, but eventually they would become as born brothers to these strange apes. He hoped that they had been among those who had known Tarzan, for that would help in the introduction of the lad and in the consummation of Akut's dearest wish, that Korak should become king of the apes. It was with difficulty, however, that Akut kept the boy from rushing into the midst of the dancing anthropoids, an act that would have meant the instant extermination of them both since the hysterical frenzy into which the great apes work themselves during the performance of their strange rites is of such a nature that even the most ferocious of the carnivora give them a wide berth at such times. As the moon declined slowly toward the lofty, 
foliaged horizon of the amphitheater the booming of the drum decreased and lessened with the exertions of the dancers, until, at last, the final note was struck and the huge beasts turned to fall upon the feast they had dragged hither for the orgy. From what he had seen and heard Akut was able to explain to Korak that the rites proclaimed the choosing of a new king, and he pointed out to the boy the massive figure of the shaggy monarch, come into his kingship, no doubt, as many human rulers have come into theirs, by the murder of his predecessor. When the apes had filled their bellies and many of them had sought the bases of the trees to curl up in sleep Akut plucked Korak by the arm. Come, he whispered. Come slowly. Follow me. Do as Akut does. Then he advanced slowly through the trees until he stood upon a bough overhanging one side of the amphitheater. Here he stood in silence for a moment. Then he uttered a low growl. Instantly a score of apes leaped to their feet. Their savage little eyes sped quickly around the periphery of the clearing. The king ape was the first to see the two figures upon the branch. He gave voice to an ominous growl. Then he took a few lumbering steps in the direction of the intruders. His hair was bristling. His legs were stiff, imparting a halting, jerky motion to his gait. Behind him pressed a number of bulls. He stopped just a little before he came beneath the two, just far enough to be beyond their spring. Wary king. Here he stood rocking himself to and fro upon his short legs, bearing his fangs in hideous grinnings, rumbling out an ever-increasing volume of growls, which were slowly but steadily increasing to the proportions of roars. Akut knew that he was planning an attack upon them. The old ape did not wish to fight. He had come with the boy to cast his lot with the tribe. I am Akut, he said. This is Korak. Korak is the son of Tarzan who was king of the apes. I, too, was king of the apes who dwelt in the midst of the great waters. We have come to hunt with you, to fight with you. We are great hunters. We are mighty fighters. Let us come in peace. The king ceased his rocking. He eyed the pair from beneath his beetling brows. His bloodshot eyes were savage and crafty. His kingship was very new and he was jealous of it. He feared the encroachments of two strange apes. The sleek, brown, hairless body of the lad spelled man, and man he feared and hated. Go away, he growled. Go away, or I will kill you. The eager lad, standing behind the great Akut, had been pulsing with anticipation and happiness. He wanted to leap down among these hairy monsters and show them that he was their friend, that he was one of them. He had expected that they would receive him with open arms, and now the words of the king ape filled him with indignation and sorrow. The blacks had set upon him and driven him away. Then he had turned to the white men, to those of his own kind only to hear the ping of bullets where he had expected words of cordial welcome. The great apes had remained his final hope. To them he looked for the companionship man had denied him. Suddenly rage overwhelmed him. The king ape was almost directly beneath him. The others were formed in a half-circle several yards behind the king. They were watching events interestedly. Before Akut could guess his intention, or prevent, the boy leaped to the ground directly in the path of the king, who had now succeeded in stimulating himself to a frenzy of fury. I am Korak, shouted the boy. I am the killer. I came to live among you as a friend. You want to drive me away. Very well, then, I shall go, but before I go I shall show you that the son of Tarzan is your master as his father was before him, that he is not afraid of your king or you. For an instant the king ape had stood motionless with surprise. He had expected no such rash action upon the part of either of the intruders. Akut was equally surprised. Now he shouted excitedly for Korak to come back, for he knew that in the sacred arena the other bulls might be expected to come to the assistance of their king against an outsider, though there was small likelihood that the king would need assistance. Once those mighty jaws closed upon the boy's soft neck the end would come quickly. To leap to his rescue would mean death for Akut, too, but the brave old ape never hesitated. 
Bristling and growling, he dropped to the sword just as the king ape charged. The beast's hands clutched for their hold as the animal sprang upon the lad. The fierce jaws were wide distended to bury the yellow fangs deeply in the brown hide. Korak, too, leaped forward to meet the attack, but leaped crouching, beneath the outstretched arms. At the instant of contact the lad pivoted on one foot, and with all the weight of his body and the strength of his trained muscles drove a clenched fist into the bull's stomach. With a gasping shriek the king ape collapsed, clutching futilely for the agile, naked creature nimbly sidestepping from his grasp. Howls of rage and dismay broke from the bull apes behind the fallen king, as with murder in their savage little hearts they rushed forward upon Korak and Akut, but the old ape was too wise to court any such unequal encounter. To have counseled the boy to retreat now would have been futile, and Akut knew it. To delay even a second in argument would have sealed the death warrants of them both. There was but a single hope and Akut seized it. Grasping the lad around the waist he lifted him bodily from the ground, and turning ran swiftly toward another tree which swung low branches above the arena. Close upon their heels swarmed the hideous mob, but Akut, although he was unburdened by the weight of the struggling Korak, was still fleeter than his pursuers. With a bound he grasped a low limb, and with the agility of a little monkey swung himself and the boy to temporary safety. Nor did he hesitate even here, but raced on through the jungle night, bearing his burden to safety. For a time the bulls pursued, but presently, as the swifter outdistanced the slower and found themselves separated from their fellows they abandoned the chase, standing roaring and screaming until the jungle reverberated to their hideous noises. Then they turned and retraced their way to the amphitheater. When Akut felt assured that they were no longer pursued he stopped and released Korak. The boy was furious. Why did you drag me away, he cried. I would have taught them. I would have taught them all. Now they will think that I am afraid of them. What they think cannot harm you, said Akut. You are alive. If I had not brought you away you would be dead now and so would I. Do you not know that even Numa slinks from the path of the great apes when there are many of them and they are mad? Chapter 9 It was an unhappy Korak who wandered aimlessly through the jungle the day following his inhospitable reception by the great apes. His heart was heavy from disappointment. Unsatisfied vengeance smouldered in his breast. He looked with hatred upon the denizens of his jungle world, baring his fighting fangs and growling at those that came within radius of his senses. The mark of his father's early life was strong upon him and enhanced by months of association with beasts, from whom the imitative faculty of youth had absorbed a countless number of little mannerisms of the predatory creatures of the wild. He bared his fangs now as naturally and upon a slight provocation as Shieta, the panther, bared his. He growled as ferociously as Akut himself. When he came suddenly upon another beast his quick crouch bore a strange resemblance to the arching of a cat's back. Korak, the killer, was looking for trouble. In his heart of hearts he hoped to meet the king ape who had driven him from the amphitheater. To this end he insisted upon remaining in the vicinity, but the exigencies of the perpetual search for food led them several miles further away during day. They were moving slowly downwind, and warily because the advantage was with whatever beast might chance to be hunting ahead of them, where their scent spore was being borne by the light breeze. Suddenly the two halted simultaneously. Two heads were cocked upon one side. Like creatures hewn from solid rock they stood immovable, listening. Not a muscle quivered. For several seconds they remained thus, then Korak advanced cautiously a few yards and leaped nimbly into a tree. Akut followed close upon his heels. Neither had made a noise that would have been appreciable to human ears at a dozen paces. Stopping often to listen they crept forward through the trees. That both were greatly puzzled was apparent from the questioning looks they cast at one another from time to time. Finally the lad caught a glimpse of a palisade a hundred yards ahead, and beyond it the tops of some goatskin tents and a number of thatched huts. His lip up curled in a savage snarl. Blacks. How he hated them. 
He signed to Akut to remain where he was while he advanced to reconnoitre. Woe betide the unfortunate villager whom the killer came upon now. Slinking through the lower branches of the trees, leaping lightly from one jungle giant to its neighbor where the distance was not too great, or swinging from one handhold to another Korak came silently toward the village. He had a voice beyond the palisade and toward that he made his way. A great tree overhung the enclosure at the very point from which the voice came. Into this Korak crept. His spear was ready in his hand. His ears told him of the proximity of a human being. All that his eyes required was a single glance to show him his target. Then, lightning-like, the missile would fly to its goal. With raised spear he crept among the branches of the tree glaring narrowly downward in search of the owner of the voice which rose to him from below. At last he saw a human back. The spear hand flew to the limit of the throwing position to gather the force that would send the iron shod missile completely through the body of the unconscious victim. And then the killer paused. He leaned forward a little to get a better view of the target. Was it to ensure more perfect aim, or had there been that in the graceful lines and the childish curves of the little body below him that had held in check the spirit of murder running riot in his veins? He lowered his spear cautiously that it might make no noise by scraping against foliage or branches. Quietly he crouched in a comfortable position along a great limb and there he lay with wide eyes looking down in wonder upon the creature he had crept upon to kill, looking down upon a little girl, a little nut-brown maiden. The snarl had gone from his lip. His only expression was one of interested attention, he was trying to discover what the girl was doing. Suddenly a broad grin overspread his face, for a turn of the girl's body had revealed Geeka of the ivory head and the rat skin torso, Geeka of the splinter limbs and the disreputable appearance. The little girl raised the marred face to hers and rocking herself backward and forward crooned a plaintive Arab lullaby to the doll. A softer light entered the eyes of the killer. For a long hour that passed very quickly to him Korak lay with gaze riveted upon the playing child. Not once had he had a view of the girl's full face. For the most part he saw only a mass of wavy, black hair, one brown little shoulder exposed upon the side from where her single robe was caught beneath her arm, and a shapely knee protruding from beneath her garment as she sat cross-legged upon the ground. A tilt of the head as she emphasized some maternal admonition to the passive Geeka revealed occasionally a rounded cheek or a piquant little chin. Now she was shaking a slim finger at Geeka, reprovingly, and again she crushed to her heart this only object upon which she might lavish the untold wealth of her childish affections. Korak, momentarily forgetful of his bloody mission, permitted the fingers of his spear hand to relax a little their grasp upon the shaft of his formidable weapon. It slipped, almost falling, but the occurrence recalled the killer to himself. It reminded him of his purpose in slinking stealthily upon the owner of the voice that had attracted his vengeful attention. He glanced at the spear, with its well-worn grip and cruel, barbed head. Then he let his eyes wander again to the dainty form below him. In imagination he saw the heavy weapon shooting downward. He saw it pierce the tender flesh, driving its way deep into the yielding body. He saw the ridiculous doll drop from its owner's arms to lie sprawled and pathetic beside the quivering body of the little girl. The killer shuddered, scowling at the inanimate iron and wood of the spear as though they constituted a sentient being endowed with a malignant mind. Korak wondered what the girl would do were he to drop suddenly from the tree to her side. Most likely she would scream and run away. Then would come the men of the village with spears and guns and set upon him. They would either kill him or drive him away. A lump rose in the boy's throat. He craved the companionship of his own kind, though he scarce realized how greatly. He would have liked to slip down beside the little girl and talk with her, though he knew from the words he had overheard that she spoke a language with which he was unfamiliar. They could have talked by signs a little. That would have been better than nothing. Two, he would have been glad to see her face. What he had glimpsed assured him that she was pretty, but her strongest appeal to him lay in the affectionate nature revealed by her gentle mothering of the grotesque doll. At last he hit upon a plan. 
He would attract her attention, and reassure her by a smiling greeting from a greater distance. Silently he wormed his way back into the tree. It was his intention to hail her from beyond the palisade, giving her the feeling of security which he imagined the stout barricade would afford. He had scarcely left his position in the tree when his attention was attracted by a considerable noise upon the opposite side of the village. By moving a little he could see the gate at the far end of the main street. A number of men, women and children were running toward it. It swung open, revealing the head of a caravan upon the opposite side. In troop the motley organization, black slaves and dark-hued Arabs of the northern deserts, cursing camel drivers urging on their vicious charges, overburdened donkeys, waving sadly pendulous ears while they endured with stoic patience the brutalities of their masters, goats, sheep and horses. Into the village they all trooped behind a tall, sour, old man, who rode without greetings to those who shrunk from his path directly to a large goatskin tent in the center of the village. Here he spoke to a wrinkled hag. Korak, from his vantage spot, could see it all. He saw the old man asking questions of the black woman, and then he saw the latter point toward a secluded corner of the village which was hidden from the main street by the tents of the Arabs and the huts of the natives in the direction of the tree beneath which the little girl played. This was doubtless her father, thought Korak. He had been away and his first thought upon returning was of his little daughter. How glad she would be to see him. How she would run and throw herself into his arms, to be crushed to his breast and covered with his kisses. Korak sighed. He thought of his own father and mother far away in London. He returned to his place in the tree above the girl. If he couldn't have happiness of this sort himself he wanted to enjoy the happiness of others. Possibly if he made himself known to the old man he might be permitted to come to the village occasionally as a friend. It would be worth trying. He would wait until the old Arab had greeted his daughter, then he would make his presence known with signs of peace. The Arab was striding softly toward the girl. In a moment he would be beside her, and then how surprised and delighted she would be. Korak's eye sparkled in anticipation, and now the old man stood behind the little girl. His stern old face was still unrelaxed. The child was yet unconscious of his presence. She prattled on to the unresponsive Geeka. Then the old man coughed. With a start the child glanced quickly up over her shoulder. Korak could see her full face now. It was very beautiful in its sweet and innocent childishness, all soft and lovely curves. He could see her great, dark eyes. He looked for the happy love light that would follow recognition, but it did not come. Instead, terror, stark, paralyzing terror, was mirrored in her eyes, in the expression of her mouth, in the tense, cowering attitude of her body. A grim smile curved the thin, cruel lip of the Arab. The child essayed to crawl away, but before she could get out of his reach the old man kicked her brutally sending her sprawling upon the grass. Then he followed her up to seize and strike her as was his custom. Above them, in the tree, a beast crouched where a moment before had been a boy a beast with dilating nostrils and bared fangs a beast that trembled with rage. The Shek was stooping to reach for the gull when the killer dropped to the ground at his side. His spear was still in his left hand but he had forgotten it. Instead his right fist was clenched and as the Sheik took a backward step, astonished by the sudden materialization of this strange apparition apparently out of clear air, the heavy fist landed full upon his mouth backed by the weight of the young giant and the terrific power of his more than human muscles. Bleeding and senseless the Sheik sank to earth. Korak turned toward the child. She had regained her feet and stood wide-eyed and frightened, looking first into his face and then, horror-struck at the recumbent figure of the Sheik. In an involuntary gesture of protection the killer threw an arm about the girl's shoulders and stood waiting for the Arab to regain consciousness. For a moment they remained thus, when the girl spoke. When he regains his senses he will kill me, she said, in Arabic. Korak could not understand her. He shook his head, speaking to her first in English and then in the language of the great apes but neither of these was intelligible to her. 
She leaned forward and touched the hilt of the long knife that the Arab wore. Then she raised her clasped hand above her head and drove an imaginary blade into her breast above her heart. Korak understood. The old man would kill her. The girl came to his side again and stood there trembling. She did not fear him. Why should she? He had saved her from a terrible beating at the hands of the Sheik. Never, in her memory, had another so befriended her. She looked up into his face. It was a boyish, handsome face, nut brown like her own. She admired the spotted leopard skin that circled his lithe body from one shoulder to his knees. The metal anklets and armlets adorning him aroused her envy. Always had she coveted something of the kind, but never had the Sheik permitted her more than the single cotton garment that barely sufficed to cover her nakedness. No furs or silks or jewellery had there ever been for little Mariam. And Korak looked at the girl. He had always held girls in a species of contempt. Boys who associated with them were, in his estimation, mollycoddles. He wondered what he should do. Could he leave her here to be abused, possibly murdered, by the villainous old Arab? No. But, on the other hand, could he take her into the jungle with him? What could he accomplish burdened by a weak and frightened girl? She would scream at her own shadow when the moon came out upon the jungle night and the great beasts roamed, moaning and roaring, through the darkness. He stood for several minutes buried in thought. The girl watched his face, wondering what was passing in his mind. She, too, was thinking of the future. She feared to remain and suffer the vengeance of the Sheik. There was no one in all the world to whom she might turn, other than this half-naked stranger who had dropped miraculously from the clouds to save her from one of the sheik's accustomed beatings. Would her new friend leave her now? Wistfully she gazed at his intent face. She moved a little closer to him, laying a slim, brown hand upon his arm. The contact awakened the lad from his absorption. He looked down at her, and then his arm went about her shoulder once more for he saw tears upon her lashes. Come, he said. The jungle is kinder than man. You shall live in the jungle and Korak and Akut will protect you. She did not understand his words, but the pressure of his arm drawing her away from the prostrate Arab and the tents was quite intelligible. One little arm crept about his waist and together they walked toward the palisade. Beneath the great tree that had harboured Korak while he watched the girl at play he lifted her in his arms and throwing her lightly across his shoulder leaped nimbly into the lower branches. Her arms were about his neck and from one little hand geek had dangled down his straight young back. And so Mariam entered the jungle with Korak, trusting, in her childish innocence, the stranger who had befriended her and perhaps influenced in her belief in him by that strange intuitive power possessed by woman. She had no conception of what the future might hold. She did not know, nor could she have guessed the manner of life led by her protector. Possibly she pictured a distant village similar to that of the Sheik in which lived other white men like the stranger. That she was to be taken into the savage, prime vow life of a jungle beast could not have occurred to her. Had it, her little heart would have palpitated with fear. Often had she wished to run away from the cruelties of the Sheik and Mabunu, but the dangers of the jungle always had deterred her. The two had gone but a short distance from the village when the girl spied the huge proportions of the great Akut. With a half-stifled scream she clung more closely to Korak, and pointed fearfully toward the ape. Akut, thinking that the killer was returning with a prisoner, came growling toward them a little girl aroused no more sympathy in the beast's heart than would a full-grown bull ape. She was a stranger and therefore to be killed. He bared his yellow fangs as he approached, and to his surprise the killer bared his likewise, but he bared them at Akut, and snarled menacingly. Ah, thought Akut, the killer has taken a mate, and so, obedient to the tribal laws of his kind, he left them alone becoming suddenly absorbed in a fuzzy caterpillar of peculiarly succulent appearance. The lava disposed of, he glanced from the corner of an eye at Korak. The youth had deposited his burden upon a large limb, where she clung desperately to keep from falling. 
She will accompany us, said Korak to Akart, jerking a thumb in the direction of the girl. Do not harm her. We will protect her. Akut shrugged. To be burdened by the young of man was in no way to his liking. He could see from her evident fright at her position on the branch, and from the terrified glances she cast in his direction that she was hopelessly unfit. By all the ethics of Akut's training and inheritance the unfit should be eliminated, but if the killer wished this there was nothing to be done about it but to tolerate her. Akut certainly didn't want her of that he was quite positive. Her skin was too smooth and hairless. Quite snake-like, in fact, and her face was most unattractive. Not at all like that of a certain lovely she he had particularly noticed among the apes in the amphitheater the previous night. Ah, there was true feminine beauty for one, a great, generous mouth, lovely, yellow fangs, and the cutest, softest side whiskers. Akut sighed. Then he rose, expanded his great chest and strutted back and forth along a substantial branch, for even a puny thing like this she of Korax might admire his fine coat and his graceful carriage. But poor little Miriam only shrank closer to Korak and almost wished that she were back in the village of the Shek where the terrors of existence were of human origin, and so more or less familiar. The hideous ape frightened her. He was so large and so ferocious in appearance. His actions she could only interpret as a menace, for how could she guess that he was parading to excite admiration? Nor could she know of the bond of fellowship which existed between this great brute and the godlike youth who had rescued her from the Shek. Maryam spent an evening and a night of unmitigated terror. Korak and Akut led her along dizzy ways as they searched for food. Once they hid her in the branches of a tree while they stalked a nearby buck. Even her natural terror of being left alone in the awful jungle was submerged in a greater horror as she saw the man and the beast spring simultaneously upon their prey and drag it down, as she saw the handsome face of her preserver contorted in a bestial snarl, as she saw his strong, white teeth buried in the soft flesh of the kill. When he came back to her blood smeared his face and hands and breast and she shrank from him as he offered her a huge hunk of hot, raw meat. He was evidently much disturbed by her refusal to eat and when, a moment later, he scampered away into the forest to return with fruit for her she was once more forced to alter her estimation of him. This time she did not shrink, but acknowledged his gift with a smile that, had she known it, was more than ample payment to the affection-starved boy. The sleeping problem vexed Korak. He knew that the girl could not balance herself in safety in a tree crotch while she slept nor would it be safe to permit her to sleep upon the ground open to the attacks of prowling beasts of prey. There was but a single solution that presented itself, he must hold her in his arms all night. And that he did, with Akut braced upon one side of her and he upon the other, so that she was warmed by the bodies of them both. She did not sleep much until the night was half spent, but at last nature overcame her terrors of the black abyss beneath and the hairy body of the wild beast at her side and she fell into a deep slumber which outlasted the darkness. When she opened her eyes the sun was well up. At first she could not believe in the reality of her position. Her head had rolled from Korak's shoulder so that her eyes were directed upon the hairy back of the ape. At sight of it she shrank away. Then she realized that someone was holding her, and turning her head she saw the smiling eyes of the youth regarding her. When he smiled she could not fear him, and now she shrank closer against him in natural revulsion toward the rough coat of the brute upon her other side. Korak spoke to her in the language of the apes, but she shook her head, and spoke to him in the language of the Arab, which was as unintelligible to him as was ape speech to her. Akut sat up and looked at them. He could understand what Korak said but the girl made only foolish noises that were entirely unintelligible and ridiculous. Akut could not understand what Korak saw in her to attract him. He looked at her long and steadily, appraising her carefully, then he scratched his head, rose and shook himself. His movement gave the girl a little start, she had forgotten Akut for the moment. Again she shrank from him. The beast saw that she feared him, and being a brute enjoyed the evidence of the terror his brutishness inspired. Crouching, he extended his huge hand stealthily toward her as though to seize her. 
she shrank still further away. Akut's eyes were busy drinking in the humor of the situation, he did not see the narrowing eyes of the boy upon him, nor the shortening neck as the broad shoulders rose in a characteristic attitude of preparation for attack. As the ape's fingers were about to close upon the girl's arm the youth rose suddenly with a short, vicious growl. A clenched fist flew before Miriam's eyes to land full upon the snout of the astonished Akut. With an explosive bellow the anthropoid reeled backward and tumbled from the tree. Korak stood glaring down upon him when a sudden swish in the bushes close by attracted his attention. The girl too was looking down, but she saw nothing but the angry ape scrambling to his feet. Then, like a bolt from a crossbow, a massive spotted, yellow fur shot into view straight for Akut's back. It was Shieta, the leopard. 